Thank you. So we'll move now to uh, questions from board members, um, starting with Dr. Merman. And uh, just I'm going to offer to share if if you have if board members have questions about portions of the record like that need to be put up on the screen, I can do that. I can share my screen. Uh, it might be easier than trying to direct people to to portions of the record. So if um, that's an option if if you need to do that. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Merman, for questions. Thanks. Well, uh, I guess thanks so much to everybody for this presentation, for the topic, for the incredible amount of work that's gone into preparing for this, uh, the staff, the CON team, UVM. <clears throat> Uh, you know, the application in itself was a heavy lift and there's been a lot of interrogatories, which um, have been a lot of work for everybody, but I also think very helpful. A lot of information has come out through those, which have been very helpful for me in my analysis. Um, you know, I think for me, I guess I'll just summarize some some thoughts and feelings about the first part of the day, which um, it, it's just very heartening. To, to know that the level of dedication and commitment of the of the UVM team, the providers, the administrators working to try to deliver um, the best that they can for their patients, the best they can for our community. Um, I, 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 I see Heather Harrington still on the on the line. I thought she was leaving, but I was going to call her out just saying, I think we're really lucky to have the Heather Harringtons of the world living in Vermont and their dedication to that level of specialty care to make it uh, make it so our patients can receive that care here and and at that quality. Um, I also was really struck by Dr. Coleman's comments, I think, about um, the impact of of uh, of financial means on the ability for Vermonters to access care and especially in relationship to where they live. We have a very rural state. Um, and for a lot of people, um, accessing care uh, on a daily basis is a challenge without transportation uh, to get to even their local hospital. Um, with all of that, I actually really was hoping to start uh, with a discussion with Eve Hoare. Uh, and I think I appreciated your comment. What did you say? Um, you like the numbers and you want to go line by line. And I, there's a section of this that I just really feel like, from my understanding, um, I, I think it would just be really helpful to go line by line and some data. And I don't know, Mr. Barber, if you can put up the UVM slides uh, easily, but slide four as a nice chart of the surgical, surgical demand forecast from UVM. So one of the things that I it took me a lot of time to sort through through the presentation through the through the um, initial submission and the interrogatories and consultant reports is is this whole concept of what is the baseline and what is what's and, and how to think about these forecasted growths over time. <clears throat> And part of that is the baseline kind of has been referred to with a little, a few times, but different numbers. I mean, it all sounds like it's about around 19,000 patients. The uh, the workbook says the actual for 2019 is 19,000. The um, narrative says 18,749, and a supplement to Q008 question five shows 19,152, excluding trauma and excluding these other rooms that don't seem to be uh, being used anymore, uh, these two procedure rooms that were closed at Fannie Allen and and uh, and um, three of the procedure rooms, I believe, at the main campus, which are used for things other than what is the scope of this this application. So, um, so I guess my first question is, what is the actual number of inpatient outpatient surgical cases that was performed in 2019. Is it the 18749? 
Dr. Merman, so um, thank you for that. So um, I believe I was just looking over that yesterday and we gave you that 187749 number, gosh, um, in one of the rounds. Um, I, I can't remember which round anymore. Um, but here's the reason for the for the for the disparity between the the 2019 volumes. Okay, um, so one is don't forget we identified these this set of general purpose ORs um, that that we were using, right? So we excluded our special cardiology rooms and 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 so on and so forth. So so I have to say that. Um, that there's a little bit of discrepancy um, sometimes, if you like, added the, um, uh, I'm just, Chris, I'm not sure this is the right example, but if if a, if a trauma room was added in one or, or not. Um, but, but, but on the whole, it's the, it's, the, it's the right number. The second thing we did, Dave, was we, we took all these growth forecasts and our actual volumes and um, we tortured every single chair with um, looking at those numbers with us on the inpatient and the outpatient side and said, are these real? Do you like, like, let's talk about the baseline situation. And then we talked about the SG2 growth rates for inpatient and outpatient and said, what do you think? What's going on here? And then we talked about wait lists and so on and so forth. So the, the, the delta between the that let's say roughly 19,000 number and the 19,452 is slightly adjusted for wait list volume that we knew was over and above um, an acceptable wait list amount. We were conservative about that, but here's the catch. If you don't include that wait list volume, that's demand, right? Even though you can't do it, it's, it's demand. And if SG2 says the demand's going to grow by X percent, if you don't include some of that, that excess waitlist volume, you're going to miss demand and you're going to miss the growth of that demand. So, sorry, I may be getting, uh, I'm no, looking at you no, to see if I've helpful. gone too deep because you know me about no, that. No, uh, yeah, from, no, from we, way back uh, when. But this is, yeah. No, I appreciate that. I, it's very that selectively we, done. Yeah. And, and yeah. by the way, Dave, so, uh, there's times when you can say, oh, on average, you know, we have an X percent wait list and then you apply it to every single specialty. That doesn't work here because these cases are different length. The story's different. So we did it line by line um, going down there to ask that wait list question. So it's only adjusted in a couple of cases. Does that answer your question? I, I think it's quite helpful, yes. Um, okay. And I do think that, the, you know, I think one of the other take homes from both this morning, but really reading through all of this material is that an OR is not an OR is not an OR, and a case is not a case is not a case, and that yeah. everything's, and so, which creates yeah. a lot of complexity when you're trying to figure out um, all of this forecasting. One of the other issues that I think I kind of realized reading through the submission is the, the complexity of trying to build this forecast in 21 and 22, I guess 22 effectively, which is, you know, sort of nearing the end of this incredible disruption to our healthcare delivery system nationwide, but also then addition, the Fannie Allen issues that were around that time as well. And so when I look at this chart that you we have up here, um, FY29 and FY23 look fairly, fairly about the same same volume. I think the FY23 volume actuals, I um, I don't have right in front of me. It was 19.3 or so, if I remember correctly. I'll go back and look, but yeah, go ahead and you go ahead with your question, but it's pretty, so my, it's, it's my, a little my, bit higher than before, but yeah. Yeah. So my question kind of gets into to, to this, which is when we kind of start going line by line, we see this big jump between 23 and 24 in this forecast, which I, I know the forecast was really made in 22, but I'm trying to understand um, how comfortable we are with this jump, which I believe is 16% outpatient and 9% inpatient. Sorry, I have that backwards, 16% inpatient and 9% outpatient 
that's supposed to happen between FY23 and 24 to then regain this 1.1% inpatient growth and I think a 2% outpatient growth. Oh. Um, so it, so I think so. So the, the you're quoting growth rates that are based on I think it's the ascendant expert report, if I'm remembering that correctly. I think you. Oh, yeah, or you can. I, I went from, through the I went yeah. through the workbook, and, yeah. you know, and just sort of calculated them, and that's basically what they were. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, I think the outpatient had a little higher uh, the year after this and then kind of settles into 2% for the subsequent years and the inpatient yes. looks like kind of 1.1. 1. 1. Yes. So here's what we believe. So so this is this is number one, actuals to projected. So yep. so 2023 is, um, is actuals, right? Um, and we were, um, so, so there's a little bit of, um, I'm, um, Chris, where we we were we're bringing the, the the a little bit of the Fannie Allen ORs, one more OR going online, so a, a little bit dampened. But this is about believing that demand for healthcare services, despite COVID, and this and despite our ability to to deliver, Dr. Merman was growing, right? So it, so if we had never had COVID, if we hadn't had a cyber attack and and had to close down the 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 Fannie. Allen ORs, um, we would have seen demand growing kind of in, in that in that linear way as our population so, um, grew. So the assumption was that there would be a steady increase in demand with a baseline year of 2019. And what we're seeing in 2024 is as if that steady increase had started in 2019. I think you're catching up. And, and, and it, the easy way to think about this delta here is our growing wait list, right? And, and despite efforts to, um, as Dr. Plant sa says, to kind of do the nip and tuck and find nooks and crannies where we can get these surgeries done. Um, in part, that gap is the growing is the growing wait list. And the wait list that I saw, I I've only seen one uh, wait list, I believe, unless there was something I missed in the interrogatories, which was um, like for some reason, I remember off the top of my head was like September 8th, 2022 or something like that. There was a one data point in time where there was like 441 cases, but we, do we have a, do you have an updated wait list? Is that something you continue to, to monitor? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give it to our, our master of, of wait list data is Chris Dillon. Um, okay. Great. Sure. So May, May 16th, 2024. We had 524 total patients waiting 60 days or more. 304 of those are waiting 90 days or more. Okay. Okay, so it's up 75 patients from, from I think when the submission wait list was. Okay. And I think Dr. Harrington sort of mentioned that you know there's a lot of nuances to this as you know space is available and whatnot. Okay, so yeah. when I'm looking through, I, I I look through the workbook, which I think this is a is this a document that you're, is this this seems like a valid document to look at, right? This this uh, uh, UVMMC surgical case capacity volume projections model. This is, I believe, something you you gave us, correct? But can you? I just want to make super clear. I know what you're referencing. Um, I don't know, Mike. Is it? Can you get it? It's the eight fifteen twenty twenty three. We have a we had a workbook that I think was given to oh. Mathematica to look, uh, which has the scenario projections from the SG to adjusted rec factor. Um, I have it as like an Excel okay. sheet. I'm familiar with that. I'm sure, but I might be the only one else in the room who ever okay. should say that, but, but yeah, well, so I, I know that a, vividly. Go ahead. So I guess there's a few things that stuck out to me in that, which is sort of what I, I wanted to kind of look at that other chart based upon is essentially there's this, you know, and I think our uh, ascendant called this out, which is there's the 16% increase in surgical cases from 23 to 24 uh, for inpatient demand. And, and the way I looked at this workbook, it looked to me that there was a 9% increase from an in outpatient demand, uh, basically from last year to this year. And in that, there were some interesting trends that kind of stuck out to me. 
that I was curious if we had some data to support. Uh, the big trend was that projection general surgical inpatient cases for 23 is 533, but almost triples in 24, that's 2.75 times maybe at 1491. So this massive increase of nearly eight, uh, almost 900 um, inpatient gen surge cases, and then also like a 50% increase in inpatient ortho cases from 1200 to 1800, which drives like a huge portion of, of growth actually. And, and, and especially uh, because that, that hasn't been consistent with more recent data. Is that, is that something, do we, do we know whether or not there's some external factor or, or more general surgeons or, or what's driving this inpatient ortho and gen surge growth that seems to be driving the inpatient growth? Um, hearing officer Barber, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm concerned that we might not be clear about what part of the record we're referring to. So I wonder if we could pin that down and maybe project the relevant um, data. I, I think we're talking about the response to the board's Q5 dated August 15th, 2023. And yeah, if we could Mike, pull up the specific information that uh, member I Merman is referring to, that would be helpful. Just, yeah, give me, give me a second. So <clears throat> it's, you're on this email, Mike, um, but I can forward it to you. Nope. Got um, it. Q5 Wonderful. corrected response. Is that it? It's it says actually Q6, and it's a um, oh. it was this workbook that was referenced, I think, in a bunch of the Consulting reports. Um, I just emailed it to you. I'll recognize it immediately. Um, I just need to know, is it Q5 or Q6? It should be Q6, I think. I think it came to us in August. Does that ring a bell, Dr. Merman? And I think we, um, you know, I, I, I kind of vacations and such. Of, I think we did get it back till October ish. November. This is Michael something I didn't, Pankus. I didn't follow along with previously. Um, so. Hearing officer oh, Barber, I think, I think it's our response to the board's Q6 that's dated November 16th of 2023. And the workbook was submitted in response to question two of that that. Right. Okay. So uh be at the end. Resient. Uh, is there an exhibit number? I'm not seeing any sort of workbook. And if you go I'll beyond just... this equipment list thing, I think it might be. I think it might be on be on there. Let's see a financial assistance. Oh. I just told you. All right, let me go. Yeah, let me get. <laughs> yeah, let me get in... confidential information. Um, no, this no, was doesn't... not submitted under seal. Great. Thanks, Laura. Well, I'm not seeing an email come through from you, Dave. I, um, I can go to the website. It may be part of that. Um, it looks like it didn't. Six. Are you all seeing this in real time? <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
No, it's the same document. I, I, I don't know, Tara, are you just <laughs> any ideas? Um, um, it, it may be in our e files, um, as a separate Excel workbook. So it would not so maybe not part case of case capacity and volume projections model. There it is. The one I closed it on my side. Yes. Okay, it's just slowly. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, Mike, I should have given you the heads up on this one. This document? No. Yeah, so if you Can go you down. It? Yep. Uh, if you go to the next tab, here we go. Uh, ooh, mine's not colored. Do I see projection? Can you, I was, I was looking at the yellow tab here. Yeah, inputs, yeah. Yep. And, and then if you go down, down a little bit, yep. Further? Yeah. So you could go just a little bit more would be about there's perfect. Okay. So, and you can see in line 50, if you go over through actual yeah. cases 756, 533, and then you go back to yeah. this 2019 baseline and you yeah. stay at the 2019 baseline, assuming no growth in gen surge cases, then yeah. line 55 ortho. You go, you have a sort of a downtrend ish and inpatient ortho, and then 2024 goes back up to the looks like my guess is you had a projected increased trend starting in 2019, and you're just catching it all up between 23 and 24. And so, from the inpatient demand modeling to me, and you know, and there's of course, there's going to be some variability in this, right? This is totally makes like there's something in here that doesn't make sense to me, which is like your Sir John cases were like 27, 28, 34, 86, 137, 28. Like I assume you're not planning on decline, like decreasing the amount of surgical oncology yeah. you do. And in fact, I imagine part of this is to be able to have the capacity to do more surgical oncology cases. Like I, I Okay. I, yeah. I totally appreciate that. But in the in the context of the gen surge cases and the ortho cases, they're really a huge amount of the drive of the increased sort of baseline, the 16% bump in inpatient volume that really kind of drives, you know, over time when you apply the growth factors to that nearly, you know, it's over a thousand surgeries. So, um, so I was just trying to understand if we have any reason to believe that, um, you know, whether or not we've been understaffed in general surgery and we're going to have more general surgeons and you can take more acute volume because I assume most of the inpatient general surgery cases are acute volume. I may be, I may be mistaken on that, but um, and then inpatient ortho kind of bucks the trend um, that that I think Dr. Nichols was discussing. Yeah, I so, say, all right, here we go. So a couple of things. Number one, backstory is that, and Chris Dillon and others keep hold me keep me straight on this, but we switched the systems by which we um, managed our EHR for our ORs. Um, somewhere in the 22-ish um, um, time frame, so that the categories we we noted this in our response, but that was this was a long time ago. The okay. categories, um, so gen surge, you're going to see um, those volumes do one thing, but you're going to see weird um, weird additional volumes in other lines. So so uh, the way a surgery might have been categorized as gen surge back. Um, in the 2021 timeframe versus surge onc or some other spot um, are a little bit different. So we, we noted that um, and we just, it wasn't to take the time to make everything mesh between two, uh, you know, our legacy OR system and our epic OR system didn't seem worth the delay getting the numbers back to you guys. That That's the way I'm going to explain the, the, the general surgery um, delta that you see. And I think you if you if you look down in general, if you kind of combine all those things, it it looks good. 
on the orthopedic side of things, and I'll, I don't know if Dr. Nichols is still on or Chris, you want to comment on this, but boy, that is a great example of people really putting off surgery during COVID, right? And, and having those delays really play themselves out, um, uh, you know, in, in those years. So, so we had COVID problems in 2020 and we had COVID problems in 2021. And I know a lot of people who, you know, didn't need to have orthopedic surgeries, didn't have them. Um, so, so that's what I'm looking at that, um, that decrease in the orthopedic volumes. But, but to your point, we, we used 2019 as the baseline simply because it was the last normal year where we felt like healthcare systems were working normally, people were getting surgeries in a, in a, in a timely way. And between 2021 and 2022, because of you know the, the triple whammy of things that happened to us, we just didn't feel like that was a valid baseline to be using for estimating demand. Yeah, I can understand that. I, uh... I, I did a quick lit search, and I, a quick lit search is a dangerous thing to do because um, you know you may not get everything. But t the quick lit search I found was that for most uh, surgical volume nationally, by the end of 21, they were back to their 2019 baseline. But I think with Fannie Allen issues and the cyber issues, um, you know that could have significantly impacted yeah. uh, UVM for 21. But then we get into 22 and 23, and we sort of seem like we're stabilizing on, on a lot of those things. May I pass it to Chris, um, my colleague, Chris Dillon, to comment on that for just a quick sec? Yeah. I, I was just going to yeah. briefly add, I put my hand up quickly. I, I think the question you were originally asking was, is the 2024 projection realistic given recent years and the jump from 23 to 24, correct? F yeah. Fundamentally, yes. that was your question. Yes. So FY24 budget, right, we have 21,804 as our projected cases between the main and the Fannie, 21804, which I think is roughly in line with that graphic that you had referenced from the presentation. Yeah. As of May 1st, we were 23 cases ahead of that budget. So right on, okay. right on that line, which suggests that to me, the 2024 budget is realistic or the projection here is realistic. What I don't have is where you were going here with the breakdown between different specialties and inpatient versus outpatient. This is total OR numbers across Maine and Fannie. But I thought maybe that could be helpful in putting 2024 in context. That's super helpful. Do you do you have Maine Fannie what? broken out at all? I'm I'm sorry. Can you repeat? I heard somebody else pipe in there. I didn't hear your whole oh, sorry. comment or question. I'm sorry. Do you have the Maine campus and Fannie split for the 2024? Not current. not in this not in this number set that I have that I have right here. That can be something we can provide to you after the fact. I don't have and it is right that and and because I've seen a lot of different number sets that include different procedure rooms, is that number set that you have specific to the ORs that we are talking about in regards to the COM? I believe I believe it is. Yes, we that would be something I'd have to cross reference as well. Okay. In, yeah, because in, follow that came, up, in follow up to this meeting. Okay. Yeah, because that came up a little bit in like the Table 7C submissions where one was included uh, endoscopy cases and ECT cases and some other cases. And then the projections were quite a bit higher. Uh, and then when it was resubmitted and those cases were removed, the projections were more in line with these projections. So I just would want to make sure that yeah. the numbers that we're seeing. Definitely Endoscopy is definitely not included in what I just shared. I would have to check on ECT and some others. Okay. Um, to me, it's really important because if if 2023 is really like 19 and change and 2019 is like 19 and change, there's and we've there's discussion throughout the narrative about how surgical volumes were essentially flat from 2015 to 2019. Um, then we have a much flatter trend. I, I think the, the lived experience that we were shared with this morning is we don't have a flatter trend. But then again, I think we also, I think really identified that an OR isn't an OR and is an OR, and, and there's a difference between numbers of ORs and types of ORs available. But I think that if if 2016 uh, was, I think from one of these, this is Q00, 
two, page 20, looks like it's 1888. 2017 was 19066. 2018 was 19055. And 2019 was 18749. Uh, but you had that month where Fannie was closed. So it was probably would have realistically been 19 something. But that, that, that sounds like a fairly flat trend. And so until 2023, we're still kind of trending fairly flat compared to 2015, 2016. Would you, would you agree with that? Or does that seem, maybe it's different in 24, but at least for how we're counting cases, 18888 to 18847 to 192. I get a point, I, I calculated from 2016 to 2023, a 0.33% annual growth rate. 2.3 overall. Is that, should, should we put up this figure from Q002, page 20? Yeah, if you could just slow down and point me sorry. to the pages and the sorry. documents, I'm happy to share. <laughs> sorry, Mike. Uh, no, sorry. Q002, page 20, thanks, Mike. There's just so many, like these, there's just so many different places where these oh, volumes better. are documented in there. They're a little different in different places. So, you know, as we can see, I, I, I took the liberty to add the totals. Um, so um, they're not listed on this, this figure. Um, but they basically range within 2% of each other or, or less, uh, including 2023. Dr. Merman, is your point that you don't you're not seeing demand increasing over this time period due to these numbers? Uh, demand is a different uh, thing than that's I think right. what's, what's actually performed. Uh, I think you've discussed that. That's with correct. The, the wait times, although wait times, I don't think were collected until 2019. Um, I'm not sure if they were collected before that. Um, but I would I would I I wouldn't say that I don't think demand is increasing. Um, but what I'm, I don't think that's what this is saying. What this is saying is the amount of cases performed, it seems Correct. to be flat. Yes. And, and, and to sort of complicate this issue, I think that, um, you know, right before this period of time or in 2016, uh, there was the ASC application and there was a, a sworn statement from Dr. Brumstead in that time that said that, that I can actually find the quote here. But essentially paraphrasing that there was no, you know, that they, there was plenty of capacity uh, for now into the in, into the near future. Um, and at the time, it appeared that at least Fanny Hallen had a fair amount of capacity. But I think that the issue is, or what, what, I mean, I guess, what do you think is the issue with that? I mean, what's the, if Fanny Allen at 66% capacity, I think in the 20, oh, geez, now I got to get another document you sent me. Hold on a sec, Mike. The one I it's the one I had sent you this morning, which was the reference back from the Q zero zero eight. Apologize, give me a second, I'll tell you the name of it. It's the attachment on a Q008. Yep. Uh, just give me a minute to get there, please. Uh, I, that's not what I want to show. Oh. Thank you, Tara. And that one, if you go down, I mean, UVM looks like it's, you know, above capacity there in 2019, uh, if you go back up to the top, you know, 74% capacity, 77, 79, 77, 78. It just is, and then if you go down though, Fannie was at 60 something percent capacity. It's just interesting that at the time that was described as 
Um, ample outpatient surgical capacity by Dr. Brumstead. Would you agree with that? I'm I'm uncertain, um, hearing Officer Barber, about what we're looking at right now. Could could we clarify that in the record? This is an attachment that came. It's attachment to Q008. I believe it references. I think it's Q6. The Q6. Uh, it's Q8, and for the re reference for question five. So, Dave, I'm, I'm going to take a, I'm not going to get into the data, the fine data with you, but I will say that um, when we commented on the application for the Green Mountain Surgery Center, and we said that um, we could handle the excess volume, we were wrong. That was a mistake. We should not have said that. We can say, and we know because when we tried to close the Fannie Allen and bring the outpatient surgery capacity over here by working evenings, nights, weekends, um, we couldn't do it. We know the Green Mountain Surgery Center is completely full. We actually work well with them now. We're grateful they're in the community. Um, but we did not have the capacity that was projected at that time in 18. There were some other assumptions in there in terms of population growth and so on. Um, but we know from looking backwards now, that was an error. In terms of capacity, at what we had available to meet that need. I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, but I felt like that's kind of where you were going, I thought. I mean, I think it kind of, I think, you know, if you thought, you had enough capacity then and you have similar capacity now and you're having troubles then that doesn't make sense so one of the two doesn't work so i think that's the i, I can tell you that now we can let dr plant talk but we are completely maxed out and full right now yeah. using every possible space that we can and still building up a backlog that's the reality of 2024. and and maybe I'll take the opportunity. I'm going to put on the practicing surgeon hat and share that for more than a decade, I and my division have not had enough block time. So we've had waits, we've lost patients to surrounding area centers. You've heard the encumbrance on patients having to travel. I also want to make sure all my comments were, are with full understanding, David. I would be in your position doing the same, taking hard inventory. So now I have to take off the practicing surgeon hat and I'm gonna put on the periot management team hat and I'm gonna share with you the here and now. Here and now is that over the last three years, we indeed have seen our numbers go up and I gotta share with you, our team has seen an incremental and iterative and baby step process to take on every extra operative space we can. We scrub the schedule regularly um, with Chris and team. And I also have to remind everybody, healthcare is the ultimate team sport. It's not just about one team or, or set certain set of people. It's a lot of people. And we scrub the schedule regularly, looking at volumes, looking at every place we can find to put more patients on the schedule. I need to share with everybody under oath that this very year, FY25 projection, FY24 actual, our team now has to look and say, we can't really do much more. Every space is full. And the last comment I'm going to make is, and I think it's very important that we remember, it's not cases, it's patients, it's human beings, and it's all of us that, God forbid, we need that surgical care. But I also have to remind everybody that some of that care is, in fact, pediatric dental, not done many other places, if any. And it's also, we, we and I'm going to say my team, are lasered on making sure that we continue to offer the mental health uh, service access. And that probably will increase with an increasing cadre of treatments that should be available to our mental health patients. And lastly, um, we're the institution that is expected to provide 24 seven 
access to all specialties. And I could spend a day talking about the encumbrance of that. But um, with that as a backdrop, I hope it provides some um, insight as to the, the numbers. That is super helpful. I'm sorry, I'm having a weird audio thing. I'm just going to disconnect. And... Sorry, back. Yeah, that's super. Dr. Helpful. Bender. Yeah, I, I mean, I was largely going to say what Mark said, but I, I would just add that when you're looking at these numbers from 15 to 19 that are posted right here, we've actually taken things out of the main campus and moved them over to the Fannie more recently to make more room for things that needed to happen at the inpatient. So, so what we're doing at the Fannie is different now, but there is a restriction. You know, an OR is not an OR, so there is occasional room at the Fannie, but there are no patients or surgeries that are appropriate for it. So when you're looking at, you know, the that whether or not there's space in our ORs, it's the type of space, and I, we've already talked about this, but it's the, we've decanted everything that we can to the Fannie to open up in the open up on the main campus, but we've done that to the maximum ability. And there's, I, th I think that's an important point that we haven't quite made yet. We have moved things around. You know, and maybe as an extra element of detail, and Patrick is the best team member you could ever have. Um, maybe an extra element is there is no HEPA filtration at the Fanny. So that's the way the air is circulated and filtered. Um, you know, we, we certainly can do the cases we're doing there now, but that's an extraordinary encumbrance amongst others. The other thing I should share is when we're scrubbing our schedule, our relative utilization is well over 80% on a regular basis. And as you've heard, that's over the tipping point of where you're able to be open for the heart attack patients, the, you know, all the other critical care. Thanks for that. I, while we're talking about Fanny briefly, are, what's the plan for Fanny? Are, are we going to, are you going to continue to use, uh, do procedures at Fanny or is Fanny going to be decommissioned for a procedural standpoint? Dave, we're working through that right now. So um, those ORs will absolutely be repurposed. We have so many space challenges. Exactly what we do there um, depends on a number of factors, but I will commit to you that we will be using that space for some kind of patient care need. But we haven't quite sorted it out yet. Okay. And just while we're talking about spaces, um, other network hospitals in Vermont, uh, I know that, I mean, you know, I know a lot of ED docs, so I hear talks of discussion of uh, a new emergency department done at um, Porter. Is there any uh, intent in building operative space down at Porter with that renovation? Not that I'm aware of. I'm seeing shaking heads. I, I don't want to. I, not that I'm aware of. Yep. Not Dave. not that's come up network wide. I mean, I don't know if someone at Porter has been nope, I talking heard, about I it. I, I just I, heard. Of I have ED, not heard it. ED renovations. A, yeah, a new ED no. is that that's something you're, you're not aware of, or, or nothing about additional operating rooms in Porter that I've that I've heard okay. about no. um, since I arrived here. Folks at Porter have been talking about the need for. ED construction, mental health beds, specifically in the emergency room, and what it would take to be able to create those. I am not familiar with any anything beyond that conversation. I haven't heard anything come back up to me anyway. Okay. <clears throat> any any conversations about expanding operative capacity at Central Vermont Medical Center? No. No, other than what we've already been trying to do, and maybe Chris can talk about that, but we've been trying to move appropriate cases where there are surgeons that are willing to go down and there's appropriate anesthesia care to be able to move those cases from the University of Vermont Medical Center to Central Vermont Medical Center. So I know we've been trying to do that uh, with variable success as much as we can. There's obviously, as you know, lots of logistics associated with that. Um, but if you're moving kids, you want to make sure you have pediatric anesthesiologists, but um, Chris or Patrick, you might have more 
detail about that, but I know we've been trying and I've been pushing both Steve and Anna to try to make that happen because I know that they're just what you heard from um, Dr. Harrington earlier, that there's a need. And so whenever we can try to, whatever we can try to do is essentially what I've been pushing, but. Right, I, I would add that, you know, we have weekly meetings, sometimes twice weekly meetings to triage the schedule at CVMC. When we started that process in February of last year, we had identified an average of 13 open rooms per month on their schedule. The last several months going into the month, one or two open rooms. So we significantly closed the gap in their available capacity. Those one to two open rooms um, <clears throat> are used for add-ons, partial, partial day blocks, things like that to help CVMC patients gain access to those ORs. So that's the, that's been the work that's been the work ongoing. Uh, I want to pivot to a, sort of a different topic. Uh, this actually kind of speaks a little bit to Dr. Coleman's comments, um, but also to sort of a, a general uh, other um, other concept, which is the in migration out migration of patients. Uh, in your submission, I believe you said about, I think it was 51.4 or so percent of patients who receive outpatient surgical care, I believe, at University of Vermont Medical Center come from outside the HSA. Um, that's a pretty substantial portion. Um, it appears, again, this is... Uh, uh, there is a period there's, there's a report at least in 2015 or so 2016 that said there's about 20 percent in migration are you guys aware of any significant increase in your in migration over the last decade people coming from outside of the region to get surgical care at uvmmc dave i'm going to start at a high level but i think dr plant can give detail we know that our surgical specialists, Dr. Harrington, Dr. Plant, orthopedics, are doing many more after hours cases from across the state of Vermont. We have a lot of volume coming from all over our region where um, they just don't have coverage after 5 p.m. or on weekends. So there's very many weekends where our orthopedic doctors work all weekend covering ortho for the state of Vermont and upstate New York. Our urologists commonly cover urology care after 5 p.m for the state of Vermont, ENT. I could give you example after example. I think that at a high level is part of it. And Mark, I don't know, do you wanna to add to that? I echo that fully. I mean, we're seeing it um, across those very specialties. And, you know, cardiothoracic is, an, cardiothoracic is probably the most poignant um, example of where we, we have patients in wait in an acute need but that certainly exists over other specialties as well. Okay, so uh, what I'm, my impression is what you're saying, saying is the increase in immigration is largely due to emergent cases or transfer cases. I, I certainly yeah. believe that, I, 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 Mark, sorry, but I would also no. just mention that those cases are largely going at midnight, right? Because there is no, room in the schedule for them to go during the day and so it's it's not great for them and it's not great for our surgeons and our anesthesia and our nursing staff and, and almost it's it's very very common to to for your patients that you're caring for overnight to be from north country or or what have you i mean they don't often get care during the day because we're so full uh, our block schedules are so full but they are a large percentage of the patients that get care at midnight or 2 a.m I, I think I just want to make sure I, the term immigration is so what I mean by is patients who live outside the HSA receiving care an outpatient so, surgical basis within the HSA. So, David, I think I can help you understand as well. There's also the patient demographic which has transitioned. So where you used to have your radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer at any of a number of hospitals. Now the standard is robotic radical prostatectomy period full stop. So larger centers have robots, smaller centers don't. That holds true for so many other um, surgical specialties and procedures. So there is actually a, a transition to a lot of surgeries as a result of the technology that land in the larger center, hence us. So if, if that answers the question in another, it's another thread, there is uh, in migration without question.
Okay. And it's iterative. It, it, you know, it, we it, started, it, we were one of the last, and I'm sort of interrupt, but we're one of the last centers that adopted robotics in the area. And no sooner we had one and suddenly we need two. And I can tell you the service, service expansion that happened very recently is robotics was generally urology and women's. Now we have acute care surgery, ENT, thoracic, um, general surgery, colorectal, all needing access to the robot. So again, the transition is also even within our own institution, and I hope that that helps. I think it, it helps in context. It's it's hard from a data standpoint from from these large swaths of of, of the population, but I, I think it helps in context. So thank you. Um, Oh, I got a lot of questions. I think I'm going to just do a couple odds and ends that were from the beginning and then pass it off to somebody else and see if if my other questions are asked by other board members. But just one little one question. Dr. Dr. Epen mentioned uh, patient need an OR for an MI transfer. Are, are ca cardiac cath labs included in this analysis? I didn't I didn't think they were. No, no, David, I was just I was referring a very, very specific sort of cases that were brought up by folks when I was traveling, that they would come in, they would appear to be having an MI. The ideal, the, the ER doc or the doc that was covering the ER, they may not have been an ER doc at that place, but um, would say, we suspect that this patient is going to need to go to the OR or is going to need to go to the cath lab when we think they're going to need to go to the OR because there was some prior history um, that they already had. And it made it very difficult to train because we, we didn't take those patients. Uh, on a number of occasions from these outside hospitals. And the reason we didn't take them was because we didn't have we didn't have room or space where there was fear we would not be able to do the case. And so it was better not, it was judged deemed to be better not to take that patient and let that patient then find another location um, or have that emergency room find another location. So I can't tell you that we knew at the time that they were definitely going to go to the OR, but that was the fear that was happening. Uh, according to the outside hospital. And I'll just build make, on that. Does that clarify that? Yeah. So, and Dave, the other situation, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is we will take someone, they get cathed, they need a triple bypass, but the next available, it's Monday, let's say we take them today from CVMC, and they come up and get cathed, and they need a triple bypass, but the next available OR slot that the CT surgeons have is Friday. That person is going to sit in a bed this entire week waiting for their bypass, if that case could go tonight or tomorrow, then that bed's, you know, and they move through the system, then we're available for someone else. That happens all the time. If, they, if they're stable after their cath, but they're waiting for bypass, they can sit on the floor a long time, which is and, not good for anybody. And my impression reading through this is that your CT surgery ORs are included in these general purpose ORs. Is that correct? Yes. I am gonna I'm gonna tap out for a little bit. I might come back later and ask a few more questions if they're not answered. Um, but thank you. I think I'm next, so I'll just yeah. go right ahead and jump in. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I have a, just a couple of questions for the open session. Most of my questions relate to confidential materials. Um, so those will wait until we're able to do it in executive session. So I just did a couple of clarifications. So um, in the application on page nine, I have, I'll just note that my page numbers don't seem to be matching other people's stated page numbers. Um, so this is the page that has the charts from service line, fiscal year 19, patient origin, and the payer distribution. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I was following the changes in the payer mix calculations throughout the course of the binder. So in the application, the 53% commercial, 26% Medicaid, 14, sorry, 26 Medicare, 14 Medicaid, seven other, um, in a later question, I believe it was clarified that that is both inpatient and outpatient payer mix. Is that correct?
Member Lunch, this is Eve. Um, uh, I will say that this this reflects um, our our payer distribution by number of cases, not okay. by dollars. Okay, great. Okay, um, and you see, this is this is about the makeup of the shifted cases. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. And so then later in the there's a later discussion in response to the ascendant report. Um, in your submission, which let me get there and I can tell you when that was dated. Okay, so your response was dated. Robin, would you April like? April 25th. Yeah. Would you like me to try to pull that document up and share it? I don't. I don't think so. I think because it's not a chart or anything, it's just I, I wanted to confirm uh, that I'm understanding the pair mix number that's ex explained there. Um, so on page eight of that response, um, and this is not in the confidential materials, uh, but in the second, the, the last full paragraph, it indicates for outpatient cases alone, the pair mix split is 75% commercial, 11% Medicare. I believe that is based on dollars. Is that correct? Mark, I'm going to just confirm with you. This is dollars. Yeah. Well, without seeing the exact numbers up on the screen, Robin, I believe that is dollars when we made that reference. But, um... Um, hearing Officer Barber, could we display that page so that we're sure everyone is talking about the same thing? What page is so, it? It's um, page eight. It's page eight of our submission dated April 25th of 24. Page eight. There you go. Yep, you have it. Okay. So go. in the okay. in the full paragraph above the partial redaction, uh, the last sentence for outpatient cases alone, the split is seventy five percent commercial and eleven percent Medicare. Yes, those were based upon NPR dollars. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, do you happen to recall whether uh, Medicare Advantage is included in commercial in this split? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, and actually, the other question that I had already was answered um, in response to one of member Merman. So let me switch to just checking a couple more done. Um, okay, that was answered. Um, my other question I think is for Ms. Hoare. So in the discussion of the equipment list, um, you mentioned that you consulted with two experts who indicated it was not advisable to shift the sterilization uh, to the main campus. Uh, could you just explain why? I guess I can probably guess, but it would be nice to just have in the record why that's a bad idea. It was a question. I'm going from my memory member lunch, but it my takeaway was um, that it was a question of capacity that that we couldn't add without without putting the the um, service um, and timely responsiveness to the main campus ORs at risk. We could not add the additional capacity to serve the OSC to that that equipment there. Anybody remember differently than that? Chris, anything, any nuance I'm missing that's important? Okay. Yeah, nothing further. Thanks. Okay. 
Thank you. The rest of my questions are in the confidential materials, so I'll pass it on. Thank you, board member Lunch. Uh, Dr. Holmes. Oop. Am I on or am I off? Okay, there's my camera. Sorry. I think I hit the camera instead of the mute. Um, well, thank you all. Uh, this has obviously been a long process and even a long day. So uh, I will try and ask my questions briefly, although I have a fair number of them. Um, my first question is, uh, when UVMMC set out to build the Miller Building, it, it set a goal for $30 million in fundraising, and I think 1,400 people donated. And I'm wondering, in the initial OSC business plan, there was reference to setting a philanthropy funding goal. I think that was on page four. And I'm curious as to understand why there wasn't a philanthropy goal set or why there were no fundraising efforts to support um, this initiative. We. Uh... Jess, we've started that work, so we have set uh, an internal goal. We're going to try and raise hopefully 13 million. I've been out and about a lot talking about it. Um, we didn't want to start a hard campaign until we had ideally have a CON approved. We don't want to raise a bunch of money that you know maybe couldn't be used for this project. So, um, but I have been talking about it a lot with people in our community, and I have a lot of other meetings this summer, and we've been pretty clear about the need for it and all of our needs and also um, wanting to make sure that we have a certificate of need before we would start bringing in dollars for the project. But we'd like to raise 10% of the cost of the project, 13 million. Okay, and would that come out of the debt financing or would that come out of the operating cash? I have not talked to Rick about that. Rick? Yeah, at this point with our debt capacity, Jessica, I think we take it out of the cash just to to, to keep the day's cash on hand. Uh, prior. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, one argument um, that's cited, I think it's on page five that I have of the original CON application is that sending patients out of state, this is a quote, sending patients out of state for procedures they could receive at home is often more expensive to payers. So I'm just wondering if there's specific data that you have that supports the the expected lower per unit cost of the OSC surgeries relative to say out of state facilities, Dartmouth Hitchcock's outpatient surgery center, for example, um, which might be the most common other option for Vermonters. So I'm looking for a, a, a reimbursement comparison to out of state OSCs that would support that argument. E, are you aware of anything we have like that for Mark? Cost of uh, care at an outpatient OSC compared to us. I mean, we know we're an extremely low cost Medicare provider. Um, right. I don't my focus would probably be more the commercial. My focus would be more the commercial reimbursement being lower cost uh, out of state. I don't have any data to share with you today, but we can pull some together. Okay, I can share that'll personal, be great. I can share, share personal anecdotal, but so my wife had couldn't get care here. She wound up getting care at the Brigham and you can only see what the, what the reimbur I can only, I could see the reimbursement from our Blue Cross health insurer, which would, which was, I just, it was considerably higher for that same and same thing for a mam mammogram was considerably higher um, than what we would have gotten from Blue Cross. I can only tell you that that's us um, self-insured on the Blue Cross. So I know it's a little, um, so I know it's a belief that we have that it certainly going down to Boston that it costs more, but I can't tell you like statistically what that is. The other part of that, that I think it's just worthwhile to remember is that we do use those commercial payers to offset the the differences between what it costs and what we get from Medicare or Medicaid. And so when those dollars leave the state, it doesn't now offset the cost, the shift that we're trying to make on those as well, right? Because those dollars leave and it's not offsetting the Medicaid, Medicare costs that we are trying to help with on our commercial side when it leaves the state like that. So just a couple of things. I know I'm not answering your broader question, but just to keep in mind that the real issue there. And well, you're also let me ask tax. you. Let me ask you this: um, How might you know the finance team um, 
For you, Dr. Epen, how would you suggest the Green Mountain Care Board ensure um, that this idea of keeping patients local at the OSC instead of sending patients to an out-of-state OSC will in fact be more affordable for commercial payers? How can we as a board ensure that that's true? I don't know what, I guess the only way to do it is to find out you'd have to ask Blue Cross if they'd be willing to share that information as the biggest commercial payer about what it costs them to do it out of state. Um, the the other, the, the constant danger whenever we do that is if, if you cherry pick particular cases that, you know, if you just take those cases that are gonna be less expensive or um, to do out, then you're left with a, a subset of a population that's probably, there's a reason why they're not being done elsewhere and they're more expensive here as well, um, or, or more expensive elsewhere. So you have to be really careful. And we try really hard to look at them in bulk because of that. Um, I don't, I, I so just, just keep that in mind as you start doing it. That's the big challenge with ambulatory surgery centers that are for profit or, or are equipped to do very specific cases, right? There, all the other stuff that happens with it doesn't get covered. So an emergency, the bleeding that happens in the evening or the weekends or the follow-up that has to happen, there's no follow-up there. They've, they're going to come back to us or our local, whoever the local provider is. We take everyone. So it doesn't matter you know, if they're complicated, they need a particular device that's expensive. If you're, an, if you're a standalone surgery center somewhere, you just say, we don't provide that device. We don't cover that kind of a patient. We don't take the complex patients, right? So you have to be really careful, but, but I think it's a, a good question. Um, overall, how would we look at that? I, I defer back to Mark and Rick from the philosophic, if we can get more granular. And one other comment, just I, I hope we're not thinking that we should ask 4,000 Vermonters who have Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial to have to travel as far away as New Hampshire, Albany, or Mass General to get outpatient surgery. That seems um, not like a, a good plan for people in our region who need care. As I think about the AHEAD model, potentially Vermont signing on, not being able to provide that care here at the medical center would make that model extremely difficult because we'll have to pay the Medicare rates to those other hospitals when those people are leaving. So I, I just can't imagine that using out state surgery centers out of the state of Vermont is in the best interest of people who need care. So um, Rick's hand, I think. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, Mr. Vincent, did you want to say anything or I saw your hand raised. Yeah, so I think there may be a way for us to to do this, Jessica. The other thing I'll just highlight is um, even though the focus or the question was on commercial for Medicaid patients, um, as you know, I mean, we have a fixed prospective payment program. So really anything that does go out of the state from a Medicaid perspective, that is increased out of state spend that does um, that does hit our our target that that's not part of that. Uh, that's not part of that fixed payment. Um, on, let me just see, Mr. Stanislaus um, testified earlier about that the project will generate, quote, so many efficiencies. And I'm wondering if you can talk about a little bit about, um, you know, so it, there's also on page seven of the application, I believe it talks about um, the OSC will support higher provider productivity, greater patient access to care, which we've heard a lot about all day today, and I appreciate the efforts there. I'm, I'm a numbers person, so I'm trying to get a handle on the materiality of this. And so uh, is there a, do you have, for example, benchmarked percentile work RVUs per clinical FTE of, of your current surgeons, and then what you're expecting to see um, in terms of those productivity numbers with the new facility. You know, I know there's some Sullivan uh, Cotter benchmarks that are referenced, uh, I think some at some point in the interrogatories, but I'm looking for a sense of the before and after productivity projections to determine the magnitude of the improved efficiencies. Is there a way to do that? I'm going to start 
uh, member homes um, and let let some folks jump in. Um, so one of the things we were hesitant to do for the pro forma is to um, is to is to model lots of efficiency would which would have or unrealistic efficiency because of a couple of things that are happening. So one is we are taking, um, we've talked a little bit about the shift from inpatient to outpatient, but basically we're taking more complex cases and moving them out of the main ORs, in, inpatient and outpatient, and putting them in this outpatient surgery center. And so I, I think it's fair, I'll say as the as a non-clinical person, um, that that this is new territory. And while we believe there are opportunities for efficiencies, to model those efficiencies in a pro forma from the get-go, when when this will be somewhat new territory for us, we didn't think was honest and fair. And so you won't see super duper efficiencies modeled in, um, in that pro forma. Um, we think there's opportunity, and then I don't know if Scott Walters is still on, but um, we see we believe there's opportunity once we get um, a, a year or so under our belt um, to do that. Um, I think the other thing we learned from our Vizian friends, and I'm sure Dr. Plant lives this and Dr. Bender lives this every day, but the longer the surgery, a little bit of variation is, you know, mathematically more minutes. Um, and so the stakes of being over overzealous about the efficiencies that you could gain, um, particularly when we compare ourselves to Vizient benchmarked, um, didn't seem to be responsible for the for the pro from the pro forma point of view. Rick Vincent, you're on. Yeah, I think I think the surgeons may be able to give you um, a sense of a sense of that, but just concretely um, in the. In the back and forth with uh, the consultants, we did um, uh, we did highlight the need, or they highlighted actually the need to add some additional costs for increased work our view productivity. So not necessarily that we're going to add more surgeons, but that it may result in a higher um, salary level. So that alone, there is there is a piece there that we can highlight for uh, for the board on what we're what we're expecting. In terms okay. of the efficiency, but to the extent, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, no, thank you for the question, and and I would say I'm a numbers person as well. Um, in terms of the efficiencies from a pure standpoint, we're also looking at a facility that's built to 2024 and on standards. That means that the rooms are bigger; they're going to allow for more flexibility of equipment maneuvering. There's a pre anesthesia room. So you're preparing the next patient for surgery as you're completing the surgery where the, the prior patient is, is in the room. So it actually, you know, much has changed in surgical care delivery that we just can't put into the fanny. So there's an actual physical space upgrade that is very, very significant. That makes a lot of sense. And so would it, and I understand how it's it's hard enough to build a pro forma you know, going out five years, and I can appreciate all of the assumptions that have to go into it and not having a full sense of all the efficiency gains that are possible would make it challenging, but even more challenging. So is it fair then to say, since not all the efficiencies are modeled um, and throughput may be higher and costs may in fact, cost per unit, cost per case may in fact be lower just because of the efficiency gains, is it, is it, Fair then to say that the revenue may be underest underestimated and the costs may be overestimated if all of the efficiencies were considered. I mean, I can chime I'll, in. I'll and go, say, I'll go. Mark, sorry. I was going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say yes. Fair as enough. Well. That's all I need is a yes. That's okay. I know we, we're short on time, but I, yes is fine. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, really. It's a really good point. It's it, it's nuanced and it's complicated because of the reasons that Mark said that I don't want I don't want to just gloss over, right? If you take the exact same kind of cases and you move them over and you just do them. So I'm I'm going to use the example of cataract surgery. Just take the same cases and move them over, you will do more cases per OR per day. So you you will say yes, the cost will go down, productivity will go up. 
If you move more complicated cases that you weren't before prior doing in an ambulatory surgery center, the number of cases may stay the same, may even go down. Um, and so, you know, when you look at that, I mean, and I'm just seeing, just taking cataract surgeons and cataract surgeons and what they're doing, that same person may, you may look at them and go, well, they're not being as productive or they're only being equally productive because you're not accounting for the comorbidities and the complexities associated that now we can do in an ambulatory surgery setting. So, but having just there's the nuance that's there, but having said all that, I'll just, I'll just still answer your question. Yes. I think we were conservative. Um, I really do, but Eve can answer that better, but. Okay. So actually, so given what you just said and given all the possible efficiencies that could be gained that'll increase throughput and hopefully reduce the wait times that I think we've heard a lot about today and have heard about for years. Um, I guess my similar question would be, I don't know if you still use Vizient for benchmarking wait times, if I'm getting that right, but I'm wondering where are you currently at with your surgical wait times, benchmarked percentiles, and then what do you expect you'll be able to achieve in terms of the percentile um, if this OSC would open. I mean, what, what, what again? I'm looking for magnitudes of impact on patient access, and if there's a way to measure that, or if you've thought about a way to measure that, what would success look like? What is your percentile wait time now, and what would it look like if if this all the efficiencies are gained and um, and throughput is realized? Patrick Bender, uh, you probably know the Vizient data as well as anyone on the screen. Have you seen Vizient data around surgical wait times? Not in terms of um, how average amount of days that you're waiting. Yeah. The way that we're measuring it is what Chris alluded to earlier, which is how many people are waiting more than X amount of X amount of weeks out, right? So right now we're doing sixty and ninety days. Um, in but Vizient, I mean, I I used to be chief quality officer, and Vizient does not have that like average amount of or a percentile. Sorry. That's okay. So. Go so ahead. Chris Dillon may have something. Chris, do, no, do you have not, around? Not from a benchmarking perspective. I, I was just going to, you know, repeat the, the numbers that, that we cited when Dr. Merman asked and just say our goal is to get those 90 plus cases down to 90 plus days down to zero. Like we don't want right. people waiting more than 90 days for any surgery. Yeah. Obviously, there are some surgeries that need to go much sooner than 90 days. And we triage those under, you know, uh, Dr. Plant and Dr. Bender's leadership. Um, but certainly those 90 plus days um, we, we want to see very few, if any, patients waiting that long. So the potential is 304 now that are waiting 90 plus days. So you would hope that that's zero. And then of the 60 Correct. plus, there's 524 at yep. 60 plus. What would that look like if this was successful, this OSC? Well, certainly significantly reduced would be our goal. Um, we haven't set a hard target for what we want in terms of our patients waiting in the neighborhood of 60 days. But once we accomplish our 90 day target, we're gonna refocus on 60 day and, and keep going. Okay. Um, I, again, I guess I'm asking a lot of questions about benchmarking, but it looks like you or potentially Stroudwater, I think um, used in telemarker benchmarks to look at reimbursement rates. Um, and telemarker appears to also compute 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentiles for operating expenses for ambulatory surgery centers per case and per OR. Um, I'm wondering how your projected cost per case or cost per OR compares to those benchmarks in Intelemarker. Eve, is that something that you have? No, it's not something um, that I have, and um, we we could get that back to the board. Um, I want to be really careful about case mix, right within within those um, specialty lines. That that could um, we yeah. I'll just leave it at that, as you know, as a as a numbers person, um, never home. <laughs> That's yeah. fair. And also comparing it, I also understand comparing it to an academic medical center, you know surgery center would also be helpful. I, I just wondered if there was any, I'd love to just see some cost per case, cost per OR comparisons against benchmarks. And it looked like Intelemarker had some of that. So that would be really helpful. Um, 
Okay. Uh, Fanny Allen, a couple questions about Fanny Allen. Will there be any opportunity to repurpose any of the equipment in Fanny Allen for the new OSC? And has that repurposed equipment been factored into the cost of the equipment in the new OSC? Beth? Um, I would have to go back and refer to our equipment list. Um, Dr. Right. Bender, do you have a comment on that? I, I do. I, I do. We are. We have uh, upgraded the um, central sterile reprocessing equipment at the Fannie Allen, which is what is responsible for cleaning the operating room instruments, as well as the equipment from some of our clinics. And that was bought with the main purpose of being able to transport them over to the OSC when, um, when we went, if and when we build that. So there, at least from that standpoint, yes, there is some OR equipment that will be moved from Fannie to the OSC. And, and, it's, and know, it would and already have I, been factored into that equipment expense, or it that has... one, I'm not sure. That's probably an uh, an Eve question, but I can tell you that when we purchased that, we we picked the stuff that would be useful for we we need it now anyways, but we knew that it would be useful for the OSC as well because it will still have many years and cycles left in its capabilities. Yes, and the the items that we are reusing at the OSC are indicated on our equipment plan. Okay, so then. Um, Ms. Hoard, they are factored into the financials, the cost savings. Sounds like yes. I just want to make sure there's a yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you. Can Thank I you. say one more thing? The, yes. According to our facilities partners, our last major renovation of the Fannie Allen ORs was 30 years ago. So I, I'm going to say yes, some reuse, but 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 given the fact that the last renovation was a, was 30, major re renovation was 30 years ago, I, I am going to acknowledge that the opportunity to reuse a lot of the equipment that's sitting in those ORs um, or probably in those periop areas is not huge. I don't have the numbers behind that, but I wanted to be honest with you. I think that sets the context fairly. In reality, Eve, it's probably the sterile reprocessing and some of the newer equipment that we have purchased to do cases right. at the Fannie that we haven't historically done, done there that we've just purchased and then we'll eventually go to the OSC. But you're right, it's it's, it's small buckets. Thanks, yeah. Dr. The Mayor. operative operative word, some. Okay. Uh, for for that which you are not going to repurpose, is there an opportunity to sell to anybody else on some secondary market, any of the uh, equipment that you're not going to use, and is there a potential revenue opportunity there? That's not factored into the pro forma. So I'm not an expert in that space, but I can tell you specific to Eve's comments about 30 years, I think the opportunity for us would be to find a center um, that would be in need of the equipment, not looking to sell it for so donation. Yes. Or our own network hospitals, or our, definitely our own network. But again, not not leaving any piece of equipment behind. Okay. Um, Dr. Leffler mentioned the Fanning Allen being repurposed for patient care a little while ago. Um, so, if it's patient care, uh, would it be safe to assume that there might be additional incremental revenue generated from freeing up that Fannie Allen space due to this project? Uh, there might be some, obviously, some costs associated with that. But how do how do you think about that in terms of the incremental pro, pro forma? If that space is going to be used, say, for patient care, uh, with potential revenue opportunities. Depending on what the project was, I think we'd have to think about a CON if we had to upfit it for something else. So. I'm confident we're going to use that space because we need it. We're so space constrained for everything that we do. Um, exactly what goes there. We really haven't got into in-depth conversation yet. Although I will tell you, I get a lot of emails from people with good ideas for what they want. Clinicians want to put a lot of different things there. I'll tell you that. So um, I think um, there is potential, yes, to generate revenue there because I think we will be doing patient care activities. But I think it's too early to know exactly what that looks like and would it require a CON and what the revenue from that would be or the cost potentially. We could put something there that's the right thing to do that would lose money. Okay. Mental health? I'm just gonna throw that out there. Yeah. <laughs> um so um the staffing numbers reflect uh, an assumption of, I think it's 25% travelers and for OR RNs and then 10% for surgical tech and paranesthesia RNs. 
And again, I'm actually trying to get a benchmark assessment here to see if, if how those numbers might compare to other high performing OSCs. You know, for example, does IntelliMarker benchmark the percent travelers in surgery centers? See, is that a reasonable Mary, percentage? Yeah, Mary, yeah you thank you. Sure. Hi, Jessica. This is Mary Broadworth. Um, we uh, just to um, kind of share the way the healthcare staffing works is that we we always have travelers in our uh, equations because of leave of absence, coverage, a variety of things. Um, Ten percent. Uh, would be a, a real good average, right? So that's kind of what we put in for the ancillary staff. 25% for um, uh, or ORN specifically, because you have to get that specialty skill depending on the service line. And so, you know, we're going to have to have more travelers likely in those places. Um, and that's why we um, assumed a higher rate there. It's getting the right skill mix um, we can't necessarily move internal folks because they may not have the skill area yeah i'm just trying to get a sense of is that high for other i, I recognize there's always some percent <clears throat> travelers but i'm trying to get a benchmark assessment of of what would be you know what is expected or what is um what is typical i guess in other uh, outpatient surgery centers. We've seen a huge vari variation across hospitals in the percent of nurse travelers. So I'm trying mm -hmm. to get a better sense of 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 this benchmark. So Mary, why don't you give the update on the current Fannie Allen situation, which is probably yeah. our best projection. Mm -hmm. So Fannie Allen, which has outpatient surgery and we have RNs there um, for para-anesthesia. So um, pre and post-op RNs, we're, we're down to very few travelers. I think it's four as of this week. Um, and we still are, are using quite a few um, OR, RN travelers across both camp campuses. Um, to answer your question, uh, Jessica, I think what's hard for everyone to predict um, is nothing is quite settled back to normal re regarding staffing. And so I don't think anyone our peers or any other staffing agency has a benchmark for OR RNs by service line that we would find reliable right now. Um, okay. So I think 25% is very uh, conservative and probably about right. Okay, so I, let me ask you a little bit about the conservativeness of it um, because it is a it's a big cost, right? We know the travelers cost more, right? You know, there was information in the in the um submission that suggests that they do in fact cost more and i think dr nichols actually just suggested perhaps in his testimony that it may actually uh reduce efficiencies to some degree to have you know high proportions of travelers so i guess uh, in the 2023 i think there was some um data that was it was in uh Question five on page three, like five of the nine months reported in 2023 had actually less than 25% OR travelers for nurses, and six of the nine months were below the 10% for the other categories. And so it does seem conservative to somewhat to me if one for, you know, the more than half of the months you were actually below that already. And I think I heard earlier, uh, testimony that the rates, the traveler rates have come down even more. So it, I guess I would say it seems like that might be a high estimate of the cost, a conservative estimate of the cost of, in fact, the travelers go down. And in fact, you're already most of the time below the 25 and the 10. And there's a lot of testimony today and also in your um, submission about all the efforts that are being done to reduce contract workers. And so if those efforts work as designed and you know um, the, the traveler costs continue to come down, um, it seems like this is an overestimate of costs. So I'm trying to get a I sense say, of that as well. I would say in general, yes to all of that. It is a conservative estimate. We wanted to make sure to build a model where we could staff it to care for people because once again our north star on this was to get those 4,000 people care and so if that requires a certain percentage of travelers that's what we're going to do i think everything you said is true that that's a very conservative estimate in terms of the numbers and the cost but 
if, if this project's approved and we open it, we want all eight of those ORs going full speed and not being held up because we don't have enough of a certain type of provider to have the room run efficiently. Um, a couple other, I'm actually close to being done. So, uh, in the initial business plan, um, it's stated then this, this, I'm just going to need some help walking through, uh, because I was trying to pull it all together in the various parts of, of the submission. And it relates to how ancillary services are treated in the pro forma. So in the initial business plan, it was, I think on page 28, it said some related cost and revenue impacts have been excluded from the analysis. The cost and revenue for pre-surgery and post-surgery services, for example, imaging labs, office visits are not included in the financial pro forma. Margins from those services would likely further increase the margins in the financial analysis. And then it seemed like the CON initially was consistent with that exclusion. But then I saw an evolution and subsequent interrogatories regarding assumptions about utilization of ancillary services, although I don't don't think they went out as far as the financial projections, but it did seem like there was then an, a bump up of 1% or 2% of utilization for some of those ancillaries. But then question two in, in um, on page 12, it was June 23, it did say again, with respect to project related increases, no additional volumes for non operating room services are included in the financial pro forma for several reasons. One of them being our analysis indicates that we are already capturing the vast majority of diagnostic lab and post procedure follow up and therapy volumes related to outpatient surgeries for patients who ultimately seek surgery services outside of UVM due to our limited surgical capacity. So I was having a hard time tying this all together, <laughs> trying to figure out, it sounds like utilization is expected to perhaps increase, um, but then maybe it isn't. Um, and then I wasn't sure if at the end of the day, whether those ancillary volumes associated with the increased surgeries and procedures that are gonna potentially happen at this OSC if it's opened are included or not included in the financial modeling. So um, hopefully I asked that question in a way that's understandable, but it seemed I, I couldn't quite follow the dots throughout the very large binder that I have about how those were treated, what were the utilization assumptions, and whether those utilization assumptions are an underestimate of potential revenue that could be generated from ancillary services and whether they ended up in the pro forma or not. Hopefully that is a clear question. Eve, are you able to take that? I'm going to try. Um, I'm going to split this up into a demand answer and a um, and a pro forma answer, if that makes sense. So in Perfect. terms of demand, um, we did not estimate um, the um, additional need for lab services or imaging services that are associated with um, this increase in volume. And, and in particular, we did that because SG2 forecasts for for future demand on imaging, for example, the 3T MRI uh, business plan that we gave you, take take the demand uh, for imaging that's associated with injuries or other conditions that requ will require orthopedic surgery down the road. They already take that into account. So if we added our own estimate of need for that imaging and put it on top of SG2, we might be overstating demand. So. If that makes sense, that, that's the way we went. On the pro forma, we all know that inside a CPT code, um, that the, some, there are charges for services that are um, post-surgical and so on and so forth. So again, what we what we wanted to do was to keep it as clean as, as possible so that we could see the impact of opening this OSC. So, um, we have captured those downstream costs that are associated with the CPT code in the um, in the pro forma under the direct um, costs, um, and likewise on the on the inpatient side. Um, but we did uh, and, and we kind of drew the boundaries there, member Holmes, and then said, okay, if there's other costs and revenue associated with labs that happen you know, months before your surgery or an imaging that happens a month before your surgery, we're going to, we're going to leave that outside the scope of, of this thing. Um, and again, it was our attempt to be true and, and I guess conservative about the 
um, the financial impact of just this decision. Um, because it, it, as you can understand, it might lead you down the road to, to other things. It's kind of related to your Fannie Allen question where it's, where do you choose to draw the boundaries of, oh, boundaries. of a business, of a, of a pro forma and the business plan itself and its impact? Did that answer but, your but question? The, yeah, that answers my question. So to the degree but, that patients are returning to um, the HSA who perhaps have been seeking care elsewhere because they couldn't get in to see the specialist because they weren't going to be able to get to their surgery, potentially that's revenue that could be recaptured that's not included. Office visits, two months earlier labs or diagnostic Correct. imaging, things like that. Okay. Correct. Yes. Um, okay, and my final question is, um, so in the responses, there is repeated reference to expected increases in commercial insurance commensurate with cost inflation. And I think we heard Mr. Vincent talking about that as well earlier. Um, so two questions related here. Uh, on page six, in response to question five, there was an estimate of cost inflation of 5% for 2024, 4% for 2025 and 2026, and 3.5% in 2027. The first question is, I don't think that those cost inflation estimates align with the year-over-year -year operating expense growth projected in Table 3A in the submission for UVM, the sort of Table 3A UVM level operating expense growth. So I wanted to first understand that. Rick, are you able to take that? Yeah, I was trying to get to the page, but let me let me answer at high level, and then Eve and Mark, if you can get to that page, just to make sure that we um, we directly answer it. So, I think, so costs, so total operating expenses includes both cost inflation and any increases that we have. So you saw the staffing grid, for example, that we're going to have to add uh, staffing to the uh, to the uh, to the center to be able to. <clears throat> to be able to take care of the patients and then any other incremental volume related um, increases um, are also part of the total uh, expense increase. So in cost inflation is one component of that piece. Right. I'm actually just to clarify, I'm talking about table 3A, which is, um, I'll have it open to me, but that's UVMs overall, not, not for the surgery center. It's looking at your operating expenses year over year. Um, which I thought was how typically cost inflation was backed out for the for the hospital I was looking at expense growth over time for the you know. And it's question six, Jessica. Yeah, and then so question five um, on page six of the question five interrogatories you. That not you, sorry, so, so shouldn't say you. <laughs> the response was cost inflation was predicted to be 5%, 4%, 4%, and 3.5%. So I was just trying to understand, uh, I'm trying to marry up the cost inflation estimates overall um, with the expense operating expense growth that I saw projected. Hearing Officer Berber, could we pull up? Um the growth assumptions that were just mentioned, which are, I think, on page seven of our, well, actually not readily finding them. <laughs> which question is it? So I think we were looking at our responses to question set five, and I'm not sure which page we were looking at. I have page six in my notes, so. I okay, you know, you're I, right. I see the reminder is yep, it's question eight. Right. So it was the response to Q8 of Q5. So that's <laughs> one set of inflation assumptions that we were looking at. And then I would also like to pull up and display our table three that we're referring to, because we submitted that table more than once. And I want to make oh, sure so everyone I may be is looking considering at the same version. Table of that version of it. Yeah. yeah, it's entirely possible that I'm looking at different the wrong versions of 3A or what, but I'm trying I was just mm -hmm. trying to understand cost inflation because then I have a secondary question related to this, but I want to make sure that I'm understanding where your cost inflation is coming from. Okay. 
So that's that's one of the air, that's one of the data points that I was looking at. And then the second, so it's five, four, four, and three and a half. And then I was looking at <laughs> a table three A. It might have been an earlier table of three A. Um, so, but if we can pull up a table three A. One of the many. Mike, I think the last table 3A was submitted on June 15th of 23 in response to the voids Q2. That's correct. It's Q002, June 15th. Okay, I've got Q002 response. What page are we looking at? Um, these, this would have been an attachment to the responses, and it is our the CON table conformed to the financial framework for the hospital. Table 3A, there you go. So which percentages on here, Jessica, are you? Well, so for example, if you look at 2025, the total operating expense percent change looks like it's 3.2. For 2026, it looks like it's three, I can't see, maybe three point something. I'm just trying to, um, I was looking at this expense growth and trying to marry it to some degree with this table. Um, so like for 2025, let's take 2025, that was 3.2% is the percentage projected percentage change in operating expenses, right? Um, but you had 4% in 2025. So that's an example. Um, I think I'm looking so at- So is that different. where you're getting cost inflation as uh, an estimate of cost inflation from your percent change in operating expense, or is it some other method no, of so, calculating cost inflation? Yeah. So I'll, I'll just make sure that Mark can validate what I'm about to tell you, but no, that, that total percent change in operating expense is a combination of both volume and cost inflation related items um, so it's not just purely um, cost inflation okay so that would include the volume additions that are potentially anticipated for 2025 and 2026 Correct. and all that this is pure price uh this is purely price inflation I feel like we've had we've had back and forths about this over the years, and I've always felt like your cost inflation includes volume, and my cost inflation is price only. So I, I that's an in. Yeah, Mark, if you can just validate that that I'm reading this chart correctly. Yeah. So um, those cost inflations that were listed on that previous file that was up that you saw the individuals per year that was pure price inflation. Jessica. Okay. Okay. Um, so in some years, your price inflation is higher than your price times volume inflation. Well, we're kind of splitting hairs on percentages here. So, you know, um, yes, if you look at the exact number, this is a model. You know, okay. and if you look right, at the difference fair. between 3.5 and 3.8% when we're looking out, um, keep in mind that we submitted this over a year and a half ago, too. Fair enough. I'm just trying to okay, understand yeah, so, where all these numbers but, come from. But yes, so, to, to answer your so, questions, price inflation, Jessica. Okay. So I so my my second question is, and and this may have to go into uh, executive session, and if that's the case, that's fine. I'll just leave it at this one. We can follow up. But I'm I I'm wondering what are the assumed effective commercial rate increases for each of those years as assumed in the financial projections for the OSC. 
given those cost inflation assumptions. Knowing that there's a difference between effective commercial rate and cost inflation. You want to answer that, Eva or Mark? I think that I can say is at this time, what we really don't know, the biggest, um, when we look at what we expect rates to cover from a cost inflation perspective, and I'll just call out that there's a lot of conversation about that. And this is this is a deep conversation that we have in in the annual budget process. But the biggest indicator on or impactor on commercial rates is what happens with the other patient population too. You know, we've been very transparent about the calculation that we have this conversation annually. Um, and there's a connectivity there. So, you know, to the extent that the other payers, um, meaning Medicare, Medicaid, keep up with cost inflation, the impact on the commercials will be less. Um, so, no, I'm just wondering what assumptions say you made in the pro forma, because there are revenue you didn't make projections. Any assumptions. So, there must be the, the assumption, assumption that we made. The assumption that we made in the pro forma that that was applied equally to all payer categories. Okay, so the assumption was the cost inflation would be so Medicare would would increase yes. its reimbursement by five percent. Medicaid would increase its reimbursement by five percent. Okay, so if they don't, then the Medicare and Medicaid revenue expectations are too low. And the if the board does not give the commensurate uh, effective commercial rate that would be needed to, to keep cost inflation covered, then the commercial revenue is underestimated as well. Yeah or no? So what I was going to say, yeah, not necessarily. So again, going back to the how much of the OSC makes up of our total NPR, um, right now this this plan is is about three percent of our total NPR. So when we look at rates, as as the board knows, um, we're submitting a request for an overall commercial rate, and then we work with our payers to to work out are we applying that to e and codes, or reapplying that to surgeries, inpatient versus outpatient. And so we're working within the overall parameters of a sure. commercial rate increase. Um, and so, you know, exactly how that's gonna, you know, that's gonna work out in, in the future related to this OSC, we, we just, we don't know at this point. I guess I'm just trying to understand what is actually in the pro forma. What is the underlying commercial great growth expected in the pro forma, but it sounds like there isn't that level of detail. We apply the, the same percentage across all the years. Can, okay. I just, can I just, does that make sense? So all of them, we made the same assumption that they're all going to grow the same percentage, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. It's about 3% of our overall when you look at the surgeries, just that ambulatory surgery center part. And then the negotiations that go on with the commercial payers and how, you know, in any given year, it could be that they are going to fund a little bit more for cancer therapy than for surgical care. It's the total bundle that winds up mattering to us in our overall margin. So when you try to look at that portion of your commercial rates that are only going into this ambulatory surgery center, let's say it goes up, it may, they're going to bring it down someplace else so that the net at the end of the day is going to be whatever the negotiated overall rate was. So it's hard. I guess I guess I guess I'm just trying to make the point. It's hard to come down and say, you know, for this population, what is it going to be three years from now, four years? It's hard to do it for next year because of that variability that comes across when you're negotiating the overall rate and how um you know, the insurance company, and there's lots of factors that play into how they want to increase their rates or decrease their rates in particular areas that they may be thinking, gosh, we want to really drive rates down for mammograms. 
but we're willing to go a little bit higher over here because we think that the patient population, we're going to we're going to do some work on trying to get them to do some, our patients to do something different. So all of those things are factoring in it. So it's really hard. And so we just made the assumption, I think Mark said or Rick said, they're all going to go up the same amount, roughly. OK, let me just ask that, one follow up okay. question then to that, because um, I know you've done some work with Intellimarker on re reimbursements and reimbursement levels. And I'm just wondering if you have a starting point estimated for the weighted, weighted by volume and, um, and case mix, average percentile price for the OSC, what percentile are you thinking that the OSC would start at relative to other OSCs? What percentile would it be? Weighted average across all services offered. E, do you have that or is it Mark? I mean. It would be me and I have to admit that we did it service line by service line member homes and uh, I never did the average probably in part because so many of these ASC are, are are single purpose right but um but it could we could wait it I think we could find a reasonable way of doing that but no I, I'm sorry to say we, we we didn't do that um okay that would be helpful if we could see what that, if you think that there's a way to calculate that. Where are you starting from in terms of a benchmark to other, you know, on average, how expensive relative to other OSCs will this OSC be um, for the commercial pair? And I'll end there because I think I've taken up more than my time. So thank you very much for answering all my questions. I appreciate it. Great. I, um, I'll jump in. I'm next. I want to um, thank all of our team for all of their work um, on this. It's a it's a large project, um, and I want to thank UVM for all of their work. I appreciate uh, your dedication to your community, and I'm, I've been impressed by the work that's gone into this application. Uh, my role in this process is different from yours. I, I need to put this application into both a community context and a statewide context. And so um, all that's to say, I've tried to, to work at least as equally hard in my role as you all have in yours. I'd like to start, um, and as with uh, Robin and Jess, my binder numbers might be a little bit different, um, but I'll try to summarize what I'm looking at. And I don't have any tables that we need to dive into. So the First thing that I wanted to start with was the Certificate of Need Statutory Criteria 2B. It's on page 473 of my binder, um, but it says the project will not result in an undue increase in costs of medical care or an undue impact on the affordability for patients. And so I'm wondering if you did an analysis of how this project would affect the cost of medical care not just the procedures and surgeries in the OSC, but medical care for Vermonters. So I'll start, but I'm gonna need some help from the finance people in terms of how we did that. We work very hard to balance access and need to care with the cost of procedures and the affordability and what we can tell you is that cases that can be done on an outpatient basis typically cost less for people that don't have to stay overnight. Cases that can be moved from the main campus to outpatient surgery centers, the facilities fee is less. And so on an individual basis, it's better for patients if they can get patient in an outpatient surgery setting and they don't have to be admitted to the hospital. We know that that for any one individual will keep the cost of care down. Also, because this project has a positive margin. We don't have to cost shift the dollars or something else. In fact, we can use these dollars for other things that lose money. And so this project being better than even frees up dollars as Jessica was joking about for potentially mental health care or other things that we know do not generate a positive margin. The details behind that, I'm gonna turn over to the finance people but at a high level, outpatient care is cheaper. 
care that not delivered in the hospital, either Fannie Allen campus, which is counted as inpatient, or the main, main center campus, facilities fees less. People going home get lower charges and typically have less complications, recover more quickly. So at a high level, I think for our individual patients, they want outpatient surgery and it's typically better for their finances. Rick, do you want to add more of the detail? I remember Walsh, just to give you uh, some concrete uh, numbers. So in terms of the the cases that are moving from one outpatient setting to the to the new outpatient setting, we projected a 2% decrease in commercial rates. So back to the, the starting point question that um, member Holmes was asking that just that shift alone, and we move a outpatient case from the main ORs or Fannie Allen to this new uh, outpatient surgery center, commercial rates are going to go down by 2%. Any cases that we move from what Dr. Nichols um, was sharing earlier today, any cases that we move from the inpatient setting to the outpatient setting, commercial rates go down by 50%. Um, for Medicare, same thing. Uh, rates go down by about 50% um, when you move from inpatient to outpatient. And then finally, uh, Medicaid rates move from uh, we move from inpatient to outpatient, uh, go down by 25%. Thank you. So it's, um, and rightly so, it's the um, cost per case and the affordability for the patient who receives care in the facility. Um, the cost per case will is projected to go down compared to being in a hospital. Um, and that would make it more affordable for that patient. I understand. Um, the statutory criteria number one is that the proposed project aligns with statewide reform goals and principles. And I'm wondering if you um, conducted an analysis of the statewide impact of this project. Um, I understand that how you looked at it through an individual lens, um, but have you, I didn't see any in the submission, but I um, want to make sure I haven't missed anything. Has there been an, um, an analysis on within your submission, looking at the statewide um, effect of this proposal? Well, I mean, we know that for the population that we serve, this outpatient surgery center will allow more than 4,000 more patients who need care to be able to receive that care in a timely fashion close to home. And so we were very focused on the population that we serve in our HSA that we're serving now. And we firmly believe that getting those people the care they need is the right thing to do. So we focused on that need. Okay. I believe that's a statewide approach. I believe that's making sure that people have access to high quality care in a timely fashion. And the, the 4,000 patients that um, come up, I want to make sure I understand that. Is that a total of 4,000 patients um, by 2030, or is that 4,000 per year? I'm, I'm trying to make sure I follow that. By 2030, without the outpatient surgery center, more than 4,000 patients per year will not get surgery in a timely fashion. Okay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I understand that better. Um, the, this was um, brought up earlier, I think, by um, the, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. This is the HRAP uh, Certificate of Need Standard 1.3. Um, to the extent neighboring healthcare facilities provide services that will be provided by the new project, the applicant shall demonstrate a collaborative approach. And in the earlier discussion, I, I appreciate the tension between this standard and antitrust concerns. Right? Um, but still, I'm wondering if you, um, if there was any type of analysis about how this project would impact neighboring healthcare facilities? I'm going to start at a high level, but then I'm going to ask Eve to give detail behind that. This project was focused on the population that we serve, but we do know that our um, consultant analyst that looked at this did project that 
Northwest Medical Center by 2030 would be at capacity. We already heard Copley was at capacity and that was confirmed. I can tell you right now, we are sending patients to CVMC and occasionally Porter and the ability to get big volumes of patients down there just isn't easy to do with the, with the limited times you can slot people in. It's, it's actually a major job to get 100 patients down there this year. And we're gonna do it, but it, it's complicated. And also I'll tell you that if you look at Dr. Plant, right, who wants to have a full OR day, having him go back and forth between the medical center and even the Fanny, honestly, has an impact on how many cases he can do in a day. So it works much better if we say to Dr. Plant, hey, the whole day you're gonna be at the OSC or the main campus, because going back and forth actually is car time is not good uh -huh. surgeon time. So okay. we, we do know at a high level that we believe that all of the ORs around us will be full by 2030. But even more importantly, having our providers get in the car and drive the Northwest to do cases when they're not on the same electronic medical record, they may not have the same equipment, who's gonna take call? Do they, are they the add-on case? Do they get the OR time? Are we gonna displace one of their surgeons who has a case? I'll just tell you, um, Member Walsh, I've learned a lot about this year, this year using CVMC, my, our partner as an example, it's complicated. Yeah, yeah. there's hard. a lot of friction. There's a lot of friction. Um, and earlier, um, Dave and uh, Dr. Plant discussed um, some changes in patient migration patterns. And Dr. Plant mentioned uh, some growing inflow for, for certain specialty care. Um, for example, if uh, robotics are more, um, if that's current, the state of the art for current technology and there aren't robots in surrounding communities, more patients would be coming into, um, there'd be more inflow. Um, I think that that's something that we as a board have to just, um, we have to try to keep in mind. Um, in another earlier discussion, just with Jess a few moments ago, um, it was mentioned that care out of state for Vermonters is more expensive. It was asserted that care out of state is more expensive than within state for Vermonters. And it wasn't clear to me what data that was based on. So could someone just describe to me how you compared the cost of care for Vermonters at UVM versus if that patient had the same procedure done in New Hampshire or New York or Boston? We're gonna to have to pull that data for you. I think we said we don't exactly have that yet, but we will work on that. Okay, great. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any contingency plans, if you see shifts in migration patterns, if you see an outflow, you're losing business to, to surrounding areas, or you're gaining a lot of business from surrounding communities. Do you have any contingency plans on how that, what you might do, um, for the good of the state, depending on what was happening. I can tell you that over the past 18 months, under the leadership of Dr. Plant, Dr. Bender, and our nursing leadership, we've been running sprint rooms on, on the main OR campus here. So we've looked at where our greatest backlog, greatest need, and really smart people like Chris Dillon figure out, hey, we can do more total joints right now. We're gonna dedicate a sprint room to that a certain number of days per week. We're gonna increase the number of cases we can do in a day. We work down a backlog. And then we go to the next one and the next one. Um, I can also tell you, we have to do more around weekend care. Um, many weekends, we're stretching our surgeons and anesthesiologists and learners to the absolute limit because many, many cases from across Vermont are ending up here and we'll have people that, you know, many some weekends we do 30 plus cases um, with crews that are, you know, really, on call. Mm -hmm. I actually think the OSC will help that a little bit because I think a lot of times if you ask the surgeons, they say, well, I'm just gonna get it done on Sunday late night because I'm worried about the add-on problem for Monday. And the OSC may help with that, but we have to build a better plan, the AMC, to deal with the volume across the state that shows up here. I will tell mm -hmm. you, I'm proud that we serve that purpose, but it is at the expense of people working really hard on weekends, it's not sustainable. Right. Um, yeah, that brings me to my to the my next question. Um, these are related to the Mathematica report um, that came to the GMCB. Um, and I, I appreciate the conversation earlier between Dave and Eve 
regarding the various interpretations of uh, what is an OR, what's a procedure, what's a case, and what is demand. The different definitions um, will, you'll end up with different estimations depending on the definition that you start with. Um, th this morning, I asked Dr. Nichols um, about the use of specialty teams, the, the anesthesiologists, the nurses who are um, committed fully to doing hip replacements or spinal fusions and the efficiency with that. And he talked about a relative lack of, of efficiency, especially um, post-pandemic. Um, so, so I'm just trying to get a sense of your current capacity and utilization and how the estimations of future needs came about. So other than saying you're full, what's the current utilization rate for ORs and procedure rooms at UVM facilities? Chris Dillon's probably in the best position to answer that. Sure. Um, so last month, April 2024, 80.1% across the main and the Fannie. March 2024, 80.9%. February 2024, 79.1%. So significantly above uh, 75%, hovering around 80. There are occasional months where we're pushing up into the 82, 83%. These are just the last three um, that we have for you today. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and are all of the current operating rooms and procedure rooms open? during standard weekday hours, 7.30 to 5. I know in a lot of facilities, there, there'll be a procedure room that's a procedure room from 7.30 to noon and is something else in the afternoon. But I'm wondering in your facility, um, are all of the current ORs and procedure rooms open during standard weekday hours? Patrick, go ahead. I see you nodding. Dr. Uh, sure. So, um... The complicated answer is yes and no. So, so there are there are, we run 25 ORs every day. We actually have um, small procedure rooms that count as operating rooms, but there are days when we don't have the uh, where those those really small rooms, which are which are proverbial shoe boxes, they're 350 square feet compared to the 600 and some we really need, don't fit the equipment and the in the case types of the of the patients that we have. So there are there are occasional times where one is is not is not being used, but it's not from a lack of staff or desire. It's from a lack of operational ability from the equipment standpoint. Fitting fitting in there. OK, thanks. I appreciate I appreciate you explaining that. Um, what percentage of your ORs and procedure rooms are open during evenings and weekends? You we've spoken anecdotally about doc, surgeons fitting things in on Sunday evenings and such, sure. but and I know that that's not optimal. I'm not trying to advocate um, for um, creating exhausted surgeons. Right? I understand I can, that's I, not good for anybody. Sure, I can give you a general sense. I'll try to be as concise as possible. We do plan to run several ORs late into the evening on weekday evenings, three or four that are scheduled to go late just by the nature of the surgery. If you're going to do heart two heart surgeries, it's probably not going to be finished by 5 p.m., et cetera. A long, a long plastic surgery case may not finish. So we staff and plan accordingly to that. So on average, usually we'll have five or six operating rooms running till 7, 8, 9 p.m. or so um, on weekdays. And overnight, really talking about 11 o'clock or after, we usually can run two operating rooms plus labor and delivery, which is an OR that isn't even involved in this discussion. On weekends, during the daytime hours, we run three ORs um, and, and labor and delivery, and then at night, it reflects the same as on weeknights. So um, we try to try to get as many people through during the daytime for um, patient satisfaction, but also for provider well-being and staffing goals. Um, and then we, we do pare down and really become a urgent and emergent situation only, you know, from 11 o'clock till 7 a.m. Right. I do want to quickly amplify the weekend situation from the surgeon side. Um, you know, it would be no surprise to anyone during this hearing that weekend um, work, whether it be from staff or surgeon or anesthesiologist perspective, is not a big satisfier. Uh, we also talked to patients, and it was a big patient dissatisfier as well. 
I think um, I agree in my experience that, you know, consulting with a lot of different facilities, especially um, elective outpatient procedures. Nobody wants to have their spinal fusion start at 10 p.m. on a Friday, right? It's I, I, I get it. I'm just I'm trying to just drill down into what is the the actual capacity right now in the utilization. Um, Absolutely. And, and those those were situations where we were forced to look at where else can we fit volume? So yeah. we totally understand the question. Thank you. Right. And it also should be reflected that 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 does not impact that 82% or 80% that Chris just rattled off for the last three months after five o'clock those those hours are not counted in that utilization. Because utilization is seven, at least at the medical center, 730 to, to five o'clock. So we're that's the denominator. And then afterwards, everything else is additional cases beyond our denominator. And member Walsh, I'll just add that when we were forced to close the Feeney because the air quality issues. We actually tried to run Saturday ORs to make up some of the volume and mm -hmm. patients didn't want to come. We, yeah. we would say, look, we can get you in. And we had providers like Dr. Harrington was one of our providers was willing to sign up and do cases on weekends and we couldn't fill the schedule. Yeah, no, I, 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 I do understand and I am sympathetic to, to that. So um, again, just I'm trying to get this a, a big picture in the next thing kind of goes goes to the same thing with the staffing. Um, you've, you've, there's been discussion about the your capacities full um, and it's not because you don't have the people or the patients it's because you don't have the space. But I, I'm, I'm wondering as you look toward having um, you look toward having an o OSC. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about what you see as the challenges for having enough um, physicians, surgeons, anesthesiologists, nurses? Um, there was a conversation earlier with Jess. It sounded like you're anticipating a relatively high number of travelers to ensure their specialty knowledge. Um, what percent are travelers now, and and what do you what do you see happening uh, in the near and medium future? Mary, do you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, again, you know, we we talk about um, part of the ecosystem is having some percentage of travelers, and we've talked about our assumptions um, in the submission. Uh, and we're, you know, we are still using travelers depending on, um, I would say, depending on the service line. So it is very dependent on the skill mix and level. We are seeing. Um, as I mentioned in my comments earlier, um, you know, better performance for us hiring um, nurses in particular. So we're adding net nurses to our overall, as well as um, our ability to retain um, within the system. So during COVID, and I'm sure you're all aware, we had um, significant turnover and that has come down and is much more manageable. So we have much more predictability um, which is great for everybody. Um, so, you know, we are going to assume somewhere between the 10% and 25%. Um, and I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, parent anesthesia, the pre and post uh, traveler numbers we have at Fannie Allen are really low right now. Um, but those can change depending on the, the mix of employees. So we, we want to have the right assumptions in the plan. Um, so does the, that answer your question? Yeah, I think it helps. The, it sounds like recent experience is 10 to 25 percent of the of um, certain staff type are travelers. Um, and you, it was mentioned earlier that in the new um, OSC that um, you're currently anticipating that it'd be on the high end of that, that around maybe as high as 25 percent um, while you're trying to find the special the people with the specialty knowledge. Um, I would actually say it a little differently. Yeah. Okay. I actually believe that the OSC will likely fill. The OSC will be a desirable place to work. It has on site parking. It's Monday through Friday. We have the Fanny Allen people who will almost certainly almost all go over there. And there's a number of staff and nurses at the main campus who are doing mostly outpatient surgery. 
that'll be very happy to go to the OSC and work there. Um, overall, though, we will probably need to add some travelers. Once again, we made a very conservative projection in the pro forma. Um, our recruitment and retention is improving, and so I think 25 is the high end, but I think it, it's very likely, could, I think the OSC may be nearly fully staffed as the Fannie Allen is, we may feel a little more of the pressure on the main campus with some people choosing to go to the outpatient setting. Um, right. But we committed to staffing it to have the rooms be open. And so we put a high number in there to be conservative. I would quickly echo that, if I may, Steve. So that's what we saw Thanks. the decades I've seen the Fannie has always been staffed well. But there's two quick threads I want to add. One is we also, in parallel, are training our own periop staff. So we have a periop 101 program for nurses. We also have a surgical tech training program. Um, and it's kudos also, Mary, your team, you and team. Um, the traveler rate has come down so much that now we're starting to see travelers want to sign on and become permanent staff. Mm -hmm. That is actually a very, very poignant shift. Wilts, it's not large numbers. It's it's an important trend I think we can seize upon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to um, follow through with this a, a little bit. If the the new facility is is the shiny new place, right? It it is possible that there'd be a shift. A lot of people would rather work there. Um, some of the some of the material presented to us by you and our consultants um, talked about the. Um, added inpatient volume that is that would be allowed by having an outpatient facility. That added inpatient volume um, is what would make th that would drive the profitability of this project. Um, do you have a contingency plan if you're not able to have enough staff inpatient to to create that volume? Um, have you thought through that and what could you share with us what your thinking is? Got a outpatient facility humming along, but inpatients not staffed fully, but the inpatient is what was going to make this profitable in the early years. Um, so as, as we've done since the start of the pandemic in 2020, we've staffed the medical center to care for those who need us to the extent that we could. The only thing that's ever constrained us has been space. If we've needed to bring in travelers to care for everyone who needs it, we've done it up to using every room, double occupancy, and so on. So to your really good point, as we move people to the outpatient setting and we have some capacity on the main campus, we will make sure that we're staffing to take care of those patients that are here. Um, and from a margin standpoint, the big cases that'll be filling those ORs, um, and traveler rates coming down, those cases should have a margin. Um, yeah. But even if they don't, we're going to care for Vermonters who need, need us. That's why we're here. In addition, Member Walsh, I would just add, so I do cardiac anesthesia, right? And and right now, it's often that those rooms are going till 9 or 10 o'clock at night. And that has, takes a toll on the nursing staff quite significantly. And I and I talk to them, and the reason that there can be some turnover, and that is they get tired of being there at 9, 9 or 10 o'clock every second or third night. When you have additional inpatient operating rooms to take care of those inpatients, and now their days are done at 5, it becomes much easier to not only recruit people into the those specialty positions, but also to retain them. And so either multiple people that have left where in a better um, hourly working circumstance, it will, it will, that would not have been the case. And so I see that there's potential benefits in that regard as well. Yep, I get it. And um, you're, you all are describing these situations that, you know, would contribute to burnout would, um, you know, all kinds of things that earlier in the day, um, when we were just you were discussing the demand forecasting, there's the SG2 model that um, the Claritas the SG2, the kind of the inner workings of or kind of um, the proprietary and that makes it somewhat opaque. Um, there's the Hesla model that you um, or HALSA, H-A-L-S-A. Oh, HALSA. HALSA. Um, and it, I was listening to, to that information and then also thinking about Dr. Nichols um, and the conversations with Dave and Jess and others about 
some of the inefficiencies that have arisen following COVID. And in that discussion of the HALSA model, there was a discussion of, do we use our current um, timestamps of when we start, when we end, what the turnover is, um, or do we look at a benchmark? And it seemed like most of the time, the choice was to look at the, the current function, current reality over the benchmark. But I'm wondering, doesn't that bake into the calculation some of these inefficiencies, where it's slower to turn over a small room, for example? And, and so wouldn't, doesn't the use of the current status kind of bake in the inefficiencies that have been described? I'm going to go to Eve. Thanks. Remember, I, Walsh, I, I, I'd like to go back for one quick second, and then I'll promise you I'll remember your question and answer that. Um, okay. But I'm going to respectfully disagree, as I as we did with Ascendant um, in our response to their assertion that um, it was the inpatient margin that carried this project. And here's why I disagree with that. Um, I don't think it's um, from a financial analysis point of view um, uh, fair to skim off the top and and then say, oh, the rest is left for the the incremental outpatient sur surgeries, which is is the way that Ascendient approached that. Um, first, for this audience, we have to keep in mind that of the eight ORs in this OSC five of them are replacing 30-year-old ORs that are too small to do the surgeries. And in an incremental pro forma, there is no margin for replacing surgeries that you're just going to do in, in a better, more appropriate clinical space. So it's the, it's the one, in fact, Dr. Sanders and I have had back and forth about um, different ways of looking at this. But from a five-year incremental pro forma standpoint, it's always a loser. You, you, you'll see. You'll see when we replace an MRI, it's the same thing. Like there, there's unless unless we get super duper efficiency, there's no new revenue, and there's never enough to make that positive. So I I just want to set the context there um, for the for the yeah. for those inpatient cases where our costs may go up. So in this in the case that Steve talks about, where you might like. Um, take nurses from the main campus and use them um, in the outpatient surgery, surgery center. One of the beautiful things about this pro forma is if we have to replace those with travelers, that increased cost is actually already built into the pro forma, right? Because, because, because now we're backfilling the in, inpatient um, nurses that we left behind with travelers at, at about the same rate as we would have paid at the OSC. Um, the other thing I'll say, and this is, comes back to Member Holmes' comment of wh why maybe perhaps we were overly conservative, is the, the, the direct inpatient cost that you see in the pro forma reflects nurse nursing costs as of um, FY22, which is the time we, we, we were finalizing that pro forma and then and then they grew by cost inflation you know to 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 make their way into the years that you see but i think we have covered fairly the the direct or indirect uh impact of staffing the osc fully now not not that i'm not giving mary a giant headache because you might have to go out and f f you know find some some more great folks but um but anyway i hope that that talks about the cost of those of those travelers and and wherever we need them, they're represented in that in that pro forma. I, I owe that to Rick Vincent, my boss, when when we do these things. All right. So now on to your um uh, Eve, before you before yeah, you go, go on, could I could I just ask a follow-up, please? Because this, this is very helpful. Um you you mentioned the um incremental addition of basically three ORs with this with this project. Um, you used an example of an MRI. Was we a new MRI? Were you talking about an additional MRI or uh, replacing an oh, existing MRI? Sorry, I was talking about a a, a replacement MRI business plan okay. and how that would, you know, if you're already operating at a capacity, just re 
replacing it because it's old and it's breaking down, you're not going to, you're not going to see a lot of incremental reimbursement. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, I went pretty fast nope, through that one. Nope. Nope. I followed. I just wanted to make sure that I heard it correctly. Um, Bring me back to your, the, the, the yeah. question that, that you followed. Yeah, it, was, it was about the HALSA model and that, um, there's yeah. been discussion of inefficiencies, you know, basically post COVID and Jim screwed everything up. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and, and, and so with the choice in the HALSA model to use current performance measures instead of benchmarks, doesn't that bake in the inefficiencies in the, in the projections for, um, what you're going to be able to do? It might have if we had used um, turn times that were from post 2019, but we actually used that. We coming back to that 2019 baseline where we were humming along, and I think Dr. Nichols referenced teams happening back then. So, so we did it for two reasons, Dr. Uh, Member Walsh. We did it because 2019 was our um, was kind of our most recent normal year, right? And it, perhaps you could have you could argue that 2023 was a pretty normal year, but but we weren't we were sitting in 21 and 22 when we were looking at that. So we looked at turn times uh, and we looked at case lengths from um, uh, from uh, 2018, 2019. I think we've shared with those those with you in a in a in one of the rounds of questions um, that we had, and they were actually remarkably consistent. And then we compared those. Um, actual times. So let's be very clear. Um, we don't think about inpatient turn times and outpatient turn times. We think about turn times by site. So we know in our main ORs where there's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, I'm just looking at Dr. Plant. He's probably cracking up listening to me talk about this in such a non-clinical way. But there's all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. going on. Emergency is coming in, you name it. So mm -hmm. that turn time is 37 minutes per case, if my memory is correct. Contrast that with the Fanny Allen. So you get healthy patients, you get predictable stuff going on, and it's 25 minutes a case. Those are also simpler cases, right? So the very, if, if you have a case go over by 5%, it's a few minutes versus a long case that happens in the main ORs. So that's the way um, I've been, I've learned from listening to all these smart people on the screen um, to think about those turn times. In the OSC, we use the Fannie Allen 25 minute a case turn time, okay? Compares mm -hmm. favorably to the Vizian benchmarks. Now we think about adding more complex, longer cases to that same setting and said, boy, you know what? That's gonna introduce a little bit more variation, longer, more complex patients, even though we have great new surgical techniques and so on and so forth to handle them. Um, we felt like, again, Sticking with that that Fannie Allen performance turn was the right thing to do um, for right now. Doesn't we're not going to try to be better, but we felt like it was the right thing to do given um, the the joints that we're going to bring over there, and so on and so forth. Does okay. that did I half answer your question or all fully answer your question? I, I I think that's good. I think it's I don't know that there's um, because of the choices that we make about. The variables and in our inputs into the models. Now I, I feel like I'm talking to someone who knows more than I do about this. But when you you make um, you have uh, you create definitions, you have assumptions. Um, I don't think it's possible to come to a concrete answer. So I'm just trying to understand um, all the the thinking that you all put into these decisions. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. I Could I give Scott to... Walters a chance to chime in here because he's really oh. our our expert and the creator of the OR model and does this for lots of clients around. Scott, I didn't mean to take your stage there. No, you you answered almost exactly as as I would have. Um, okay. <clears throat> I think you know the, the the two things we really want to do are we want to be a little bit conservative, and in facility planning, conservative is. In, unlike finance, we work, we're we're always kind of in opposition with the finance people on our definition of conservative. The building, we want to make it just a little bit bigger. And by using those assumptions, 
I, I think, I think you're going to beat them. Uh, you know, the, the, we have absolutely not baked into the operations the same old way of doing business. So the building is programmed and designed to be more efficient and to work better than the fanny and to have the right ratios between prep, OR, phase one, phase two, extended overnight recovery, which we do not have at the fanny in, in any way. Um, so the building ought to function better than the fanny which means you have the opportunity to beat those numbers and we've we've but I don't want to until I until I can prove how much better it ought to be I don't want to take credit for it in either the operating uh the the demand assumptions or the financial assumptions so I I think we've got more good guys than bad guys that are hiding out there uh, we're going to go looking for all those good guys, and we're going to manage away the bad guys. So I, I think we're going to beat it, uh, but I, I can't tell you by how much we're going to beat it. Are we going to beat it by three minutes, two minutes, five minutes? Uh, I think any of those is plausible, uh, but I don't want to count on it and then and then be wrong. I understand. I, I know um, I can hit that 25-minute number. I have just um, two more questions. Um, as part of the justification for the additional capacity, um, we noted that the over 65 population in Burlington was projected to increase by a lot initially, 62% in the ori original submission. Earlier, you presented a, a new analysis with Claritas um, using 41% uh, growth. Um, the US Census forecasts about a 36% increase. Um, Vermont's state projection is 31 to 39. Um, and I appreciated it earlier that you walked through how the surgical demand model changes with different population growth estimates, but it's, it's unclear how that worked, right? You asserted that a 62% population growth would lead to a 22% increase in surgical demand. And a 41% population growth would still yield a 17% increase. So a 20 point drop, drop in population growth would only be a 5% loss in surgical demand. Um, but I wanna just consider an extreme example. What's your, what is the contingency plan if the population growth, your population growth estimates are off by 50%? Um, you So we asked ourselves, Austin. so wait, let's, oh, please go, go ahead. Keep, go, All go right. ahead. So Tom, specific, so, excuse me, Member Walsh, you're specifically okay. saying, I, I if, if, Tom. So, okay. if, if you're, if you're saying if those 65 and over estimates are indeed 40% uh, growth in 10 years and not 62% growth in 10 years. Or if they're 31% as the state the low end of what the state recommended. So, and is it, that for the state or for Chittenden County? That's for Burlington. Okay. So, um, what I can tell you is that we, so far, um, that we have been, um, in terms of population projections and the latest estimates. So, the, I go to the Department of Health website and look at the population estimates. Um, 65 and over under 65 for Chittenden County. And right now, um, since 2019, we've been tracking really, really close um, to those estimates for Chittenden County. Um, I've been doing this job for eight years. I have seen national forecasters, um, including the Census Bureau prior to 2020, really underestimate the, what's going on in Vermont. We're almost too little sometimes, I feel like, for anybody to care about. Um, I. So I hear you. You know what? So so what we know is that at 40% growth of the 65 and over population, our growth in inpatient surgeries goes from 10% to 5%, far less than the than the growth in the 65 and over population, okay? Um, mm -hmm. In part because we're able to do some surgeries outpatient that we used to be able to do um, inpatient. And we see a similar decline in the outpatient surgery growth. But I spent a lot of time particularly thinking about the conversations that are held with the Green Mountain Care Board about access, I also think about the other problem. What if growth is higher than we think? Because I think that's the problem we got into before. And so mm -hmm. with a 
with a three or four year runway to building capacity, it really influenced the kind of conversations we asked ourselves about what if we're wrong? Like, like don't we need to look at a couple of different forecasts? And, and I was happy to <laughs> update for the SG2, um, the, the SG2 forecast, but I'm equally concerned with what if we're wrong and we need more healthcare services right. um, than, than, um, than these forecasts uh, project, which yeah. is kind of what led us to the, um, you know, it, you could look at the numbers and you could say, oh, you should, you should, you should be building out those, uh, all four of those shelled ORs right now. You say, you know, Mathematica says you need 11. And, and I feel like that's, that's probably not right, and I think we can we we're thinking about that concert that you know what if this is a little um, overestimated, and having yeah. those shelled ORs to be able to build more quickly should we should we need them sooner than we thought. And if if I can add the explanation for why that's true, everybody's looking at sixty five plus. That is a gross oversimplification. In five years, the last baby boomer is going to turn 65. So when you're looking at those 10-year projections, you've only got five years of boomers aging into 65. And then you've got my generation, the teeny tiny, nobody was born then generation, aging into 65. So the 65 plus growth is going to continue fairly strong for five, then it levels out. Yeah. But if you look at how people utilize healthcare, and SG2 misses this, their model only looks at 65 plus. You got to look at 75 plus and 85 plus. 75 year olds use healthcare 50% more than 65 year olds. 85 year olds use healthcare twice as 65 year old. Those boomers are still moving into the 75, and they're now moving into the 85. And those, that's what they're missing. And yep. that's what, when you just look at 65 plus, you are missing that those boomers are now moving into the, not just the 100% growth, but the 150 growth and the 200 growth. And if you're only looking at 65 plus, you're missing that. And that is a big, big, big thing to miss. It will, it is gonna bite us hard and most people aren't waiting for it. And it scares me. Yeah. So. Tom, yeah, yeah, please comment. I, I, I like the question so much because it's so hard to predict the future and we haven't always got it right in the past. So here's how I think about this. I am extremely confident we need eight ORs right now today. If you look at our backlogs, our efficiencies, what we're doing, if we could open the three extra ORs tomorrow, we would do it and I'm confident they would be full. Down the road, building the shell space for four additional ORs, allows us when the timing is right and when we need it to use that space or delay it for a long time if we don't. So what's good about this project is it, it allows some flexibility for the future. That's once again, we've re we realized and other projects that we've done, we haven't exactly got it right. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's hard to get right. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen it a number of places. And so just quickly, my, my concern about this, right? If, um, if the growth is higher than we've been talking about and every place is filled to capacity, um, that increases the volume of care, that decreases the backlog uh, for patients um, in Chittenden County and the, the Burlington HSA and surrounding areas. Um, but that increased utilization then contributes to driving the medical trend higher for the state, which increases the premiums that Vermonters will feel, and most people, um, and that will be for for patients across the state, people across the state, whether they use healthcare or not, whether they go to UVM or not. Um, most people feel affordability with their premiums and deductibles, not hospital prices. So if if the demand for this facility just takes off, um, that could impact people across the state. Um, if the growth estimates are too slow, right, the population growth levels off, people don't keep coming to Vermont the same way they were during the pandemic, um, and the facility is not used to capacity, well, 
the response then, I'm not sure you all would do it. I haven't seen you this way, but in experience other places, when you're not at capacity, you advertise and try to compete more regionally. And if this project is pulling, if the inflow increases and area hospitals are losing profitable outpatient surgeries, that could destabilize the functioning of the entire hospital. And if and area um, communities could lose access to all the services provided by the hospital, not just outpatient surgeries. So whether it's too high or too low in, in the extreme examples that I've outlined, um, it becomes problematic from a statewide level. So I'm just trying to understand where this is and, and think critically about what it means across the state. So just one more question. Um, and this, y'all talked with Jess a, a little bit about this and Sam with HSA. You assume that the, the price increases approved by the board um, will keep pace with inflation. Um, the method that I've seen in the last two years that you all use when you submit your increases, if inflation, for example, there's not an there's not a page to turn to over this, but let's imagine that medical inflation is 4%. Um, Medicare and Medicaid don't usually keep up. Medicare may approve 1%. So 3% less than inflation. And what I've seen with how you all budget, you would then ask us for a 7% increase to make up the difference. So what you're asking for is well above what inflation is. And so I'm just wondering if you have a contingency plan for the possibility that the full rate increases you request are not approved. Rick, you want to start? Yeah, so I think it's the it's the question that we, you know, we ask ourselves before we even submit your overall our overall budget to the to the board in in July, remember Walsh um, and we have to plan for that. Obviously, the 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 costs are real. So inflation that we, the, you know, salary increases that we provide to our staff, um, the cost of supplies, they're real. And if not everybody pays for it, then you know, obviously that you know that'll negatively impact you know the the plan. And not just for you know not just for UVM, but every single you know hospital in the state, every you know every hospital across the across the country. So obviously we're constantly looking for ways that we can minimize uh, that that increase. Um, and at the end of the day, we do have to just then take a look at what, you know, where where is it that we need to focus our resources to ensure that we have, again, going back to my, uh, my, my slide on the framework, to meet the needs of the community, we need to be able to generate a margin to reinvest in the in the organization and the community. And so we, you know, we need to look at places where we can invest, where we can't invest, um, if um, if we're not able to keep pace with uh, the cost of inflation. And, and there are opportunities. I think you know, even with certainly with Medicare, there are opportunities there um, that you know, we've been trying to tap into the last couple of years to try to relieve uh, some of the, the pressure on commercial insurance. So we don't, you know, we don't go into a budget season thinking that that's just completely off the table. You know, we're, we're trying to do some things beyond just what Medicare gives in terms of fee schedule increases to kind of help um, the, the cost to, to the moderators. But that's, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to what you're offering, you know, for services and where can we you know, work and afford to continue to offer those services. All right. Well, well, thank you. I um, like I started off with. I appreciate all that you guys are putting into this, um, and really trying to think about what's best for your community. And I appreciate you helping me um, think through some of the things I've got to think about um, about your community and the state. Um, so thank you for taking the time to answer my questions. And back to you, Chair Foster. I'm actually going to, um, before we move to Chair Foster, suggest we take a five minute break. Um, I want to talk a little bit about 
the impact on uh, other providers in Vermont. And the forecast was for no additional market share to UVM as a result of the outpatient surgery center. Is UVM planning any marketing or media campaigns relating to the outpatient surgery center? The first word used got cut off. I'm sorry. So I heard media campaign. What was the other thing you said? I'm sorry. Uh, marketing, marketing or yeah. media campaigns relating to the outpatient surgery center. We're not planning any marketing or media campaigns to try and take market share. I mean, we're doing work now to tell people that we're trying to improve access, but nothing beyond that. It would seem like having a brand new state of the art facility would be attractive to patients, which is probably a good thing but it would seem like that would naturally draw from surrounding areas. Why do you think that would not be the case? Um, I think that the hospitals in each community in Vermont are important for their communities. I actually don't worry about small hospitals doing more. I worry about them doing less because we are so full. So. I believe the outpatient surgery center will be full, but I equally believe that the community hospitals will be full. There are people that want to stay local. That, that's where they can get care. That's where it's easy for them to access care. And so I'm not really concerned that we're going to have a significant material impact on Northwest, Copley, et cetera. I think they're going to be busy too. And, and I think importantly, what you heard this morning was us being more efficient, lets them get their critical ill patients down here in an easier way, that's actually probably the most important thing. I mean, we have some patients now in the Burlington HSA that go to Copley to get total joints. I actually expect that to, to continue, Chair Foster. I think there's people that choose that, um, and and we we understand that. Um, I want to take you to Exhibit four to the application. Mike, maybe page 34. Is this the page you're looking at? Yeah, and I understand this is old and attached to the original application, so it might not be current. Um, but this section is about integrated communications and engagement strategy. And to my eye, it looks like there's an engagement strategy in connection with developing the CON and getting the CON through um, that process. And then there's a section here on page 34, tactics by plan phase. And I wasn't sure what these things were or if they're still part of the plan. If you get on to the next one. Like, yeah, grand opening, yeah, that one. So there's a cost here estimated $100,000 for social media, paid content placements and ad and newspapers, paid search capture campaign relative to competitors, community and referring provider outreach, and some other things. Are, are these something that you're still planning on doing, or are these something that were an initial plan that are no longer part of the plan? I can't comment on a number of these because I wasn't part of this process. We haven't really run TV ad trying to pull market shares since I've been the president of the hospital. We're not trying to take anyone's market share. We're not trying to take cases from Northwest Medical Center or Copley. Um, and so I do imagine that we'll highlight the building. We'll be proud of the building. We'll be proud of the care that we can deliver there. Um, and so there's some balance between how we use our tools to do that. Um, I, I think some of these are likely outdated to your good point. 
I wasn't familiar with a couple. Of them. What is paid search capture campaign relative to competitors? What what is that? I don't know. Does anyone know this on our team? Know what that means? Um, and then another question, I, and again, I do recognize this document several years old, so maybe a lot's changed. But if there's such significant sure, demand, Foster. it looks like there's a hundred and yeah. Just this is Sunny. Ethan, I'll just say that we've been very, very consistent. I've been very consistent with our team around the fact that we need to communicate what we do in our area so that our patients know that's important. We want to in all of our areas, and that's been that's been actually asked for by patients. When you're in Porter, when you're in Middlebury, people want to know what are we doing in Middlebury that we can so we don't leave the area to go to Burlington if we can get that in Middlebury. Can you tell us about that? So I think that awareness is important, but I can tell you repeatedly we've had the conversation that we do not need and we should not market to try to attract more patients. It is not what we need to do. When I traveled around the state and I talked to um, every each hospital president, I said, what can we do to help you keep the patients that you need to keep here? What can we do to help you to do that? That is a direct sort of line that I have because my goal and Steve's goal is we really want those community hospitals to thrive and take care of the patients that they should be taking care of. And how can we help you to do that is has been our motto. So just want to reemphasize that. Yep. This I don't know what these I don't know what these these mean, but these obviously came out before I started as well. It isn't it isn't what we would need to do here. OK, yeah, I, I'll, I'll move on because I maybe it's dated or inconsistent with what you're planning on now, but um. It, it didn't seem necessary to spend, you know, 130 or so thousand dollars on marketing, given the given the demand, right? There's such overflow. Um, according to the presentation today, it wouldn't seem like you'd need to spend money for for advertising. I, I get the awareness point. Yeah, um, I think you're absolutely to the right. Next page. I think you're absolutely right. This sort of goes to my point that this might be outdated. If you go to the next page, Mr. Barber. Government and community relations. This project will require local and state engagement prior to and concurrent with the CON submission, with the opportunity to explain its benefits during and post construction. It has pre announcement, pre filing stakeholders, GMCB chair and members, and then a number of other types. T to my knowledge, I've never spoken with you concurrent to the CON submission about it, have I? Not that I can recall. Um, I think I would have been happy to talk to any one of the board members about about the project because I think it has so much value and I want to just make sure that everyone understands that. But I I don't think we actually have engaged with any anyone about that that I'm aware of. OK, and then on page 33, this will be the last question. I'll move on from this document because I don't know if it's that pertinent today. In the top paragraph, Mike. I think I'm there. Yeah, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, yeah, no, it's fine. It's not that it's not that pertinent. Um, I want to go to the a different topic. Which is the population growth estimates. Do you have any sense of how reliable those estimates are? I'll give you the reason why I'm asking is, you know, the state of Vermont for 25 plus years has been trying to increase um, our population pretty significantly. We haven't really done that to date, um, and the projections are pretty pretty significant. So, uh, is there any way to pressure test the accuracy of these population estimates? Want me to go? Should I take that one? Please. Um, yeah, Chair Chair Foster, it is it is really interesting um, how. Um, 
it, it, pressure testing really is, for example, I mentioned the Department of Health website um, shows the estimated population um, as recently and only as recently as 2022 um, of, for the um, under 60, I think it's by age cohort, but 65 and over versus under 65 is what I what I fact checked that against. Um, and so that's the best tool I have, which was, OK, so once we kind of know um, what the population is, how how well did um, did the forecasters we use forecast that? I think this is tricky right now because we have different parts of the state growing at different rates. Um, I'm probably telling you something that you already know all, all too well, um, but that's the best way I know how. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, I've asked around to my strategic planning colleagues around the country about what forecasts they use, and I've asked SG2 why, why they base their forecast on the Nielsen Claritas forecast. And the answer I get in a nutshell is it's just widely recognized as, as one of the best, if not the best around. Um, Um, do you know if those projections took into consideration our severe housing challenges here in Vermont? I don't know if they took those into account. Um, okay. I would um, assume if that you could get that, that to us. I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, and then in, ter in terms of staffing and the challenges with staffing. Um, was there any modeling or analysis done of the ability of UVM to meet its staffing needs for this project? Mary, do you want to um, talk about staffing? Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, as we submitted, um, you know, we believe we're going to have uh, much of at least half of the uh, current staff move over. And then our ability to uh, backfill is based on our, um, you know, our current experience around our ability to net higher, meaning we're, we're able to outpace turnover. And again, we're we're seeing that to be improved, in, especially in the last year. Um, so we, you know, we we are doing all of the strategic workforce planning uh, techniques that we we possibly can. Um, but I think, you know, the biggest um, positive of this will be our experience with Fannie Allen. Um, people really like working in that environment. Um, there's good parking. It's easy to get in and out. It's a predictable schedule. I would say of all of the staffing complexity we're dealing with, um, this outpatient surgery center is going to be um, one of the most um, desirable locations for us. It'll be new and and I think it will definitely attract um, employees. Do you track um, your ability to net hire month over month or year over year? We do and we're just getting much better at that uh, data analysis this year. We have much better um, ability to, to see those numbers and so Again, we're we're tracking our ability to um, recruit, but I think important for a lot of what we've discussed is retention, because once we have people in the area, they've got housing, um, they're learning the skills. It's really important that we retain, and we are seeing again, as I mentioned in my comments, better than um, industry, you know, regional averages re regarding retention. Chair Foster, I would just add that. Prior to the pandemic, retention was unbelievably high. There was lots and lots of people here that committed their whole careers to the UVM Medical Center. The pandemic really stood that on its head for those middle years where we lost a lot of people to all kinds of reasons. Um, we're not back to pre-pandemic, I don't wanna say that, but we are trending back in the, in the right direction. So at the peak of the pandemic, we were losing 20% of our nurses a year. Um, and last year, returner was about 6% is what I think you shared, Mary. Um, and we really want it to be as close to zero as it can be. We really want people to come establish their roots here, 
raise their families here and be here for their careers. And so we're committed to doing that hard work because um, holding on to people is how we will ultimately refill the medical center back to the point where we need the least number of travelers possible. Thank you. Um, so have you modeled out based on your net higher uh, capabilities, how long it will take to fully staff the OSC if it's approved? I don't have that number in front of me. Um, we'd have to do that modeling. I would just say, um, you know, the way we've submitted anticipates the need for um, travelers in the interim. And our, our goal, of course, is to hire full time. And so um, that will be the focus. In assessing your ability to staff the OSC, did you take into account the changing demographics that were forecasted in connection with the demand projections? Um, so if you're you're saying the, the population growth is really an older population and whether that population will be employable, is that the question? Yeah, whether or not the changing demographics into the plus 65 category in Chittenden County um, was is being considered in your capability of fully staffing the OSC. Yeah, we we live that reality now, and we're always looking at how we can do our our workforce development. Um, again, our our biggest opportunity is our current workforce. That's why we're in, investing in those programs to develop our current staff. Uh, again, they're already here. They have housing. Um, we have a large, you know, one of the the beauties of a, a large employee bases, we can um, explain that career, career growth and, uh, you know, really teach our own. Um, but it will be an ongoing challenge uh, to relocate um, folks and they will have housing challenges. And so that's why we're also investing um, in the housing we have here close to the campus. Are you, I get the traveler piece, but as of day one of opening, are you projecting being fully staffed or partially staffed? And when do you anticipate being fully staffed? So on um, day one, ahead, I'm sorry. On day one, we'll open all eight ORs. We'll use the exact number of travelers that we need to open all eight ORs. The model, which was conservative, said it'd be 25% travelers. I firmly believe it'll be less than 25%, but that's how we model it out. Got it, okay. So your projection is day one, you'll be fully staffed, fully operational, and it could be up to 25% of the staff would be based on travelers at that time, but that's conservative. That's how we built the model. Yes, yes. Ms. Coleman, I see your hand is raised. Marissa Coleman. Yes. Hi, I wanted to just jump in and add that I know that we were talking about um, workforce utilization with older adults, but we are also activating a more diverse workforce that has historically been underrepresented at UVMMC. So just want to point that out for that to not be underestimated in our projections. Great, thank you. Um, on that in a related topic, there was a note about um, expanding the training program with the college, with the University of Vermont. Um, I was wondering if you could flesh out for me what that expansion looks like and how many additional staff you think that these two projects will yield. Yeah, I would say um, we always are partnering with the University of Vermont um, College of Life Sciences and Nursing. They are our, you know, uh, partner in all of this. They're right across uh, the campus from us. Um, so we continue to do that. Um, many of the programs that I mentioned earlier today are partnering with um, several campuses, including Norwich um, and others. And most of those campuses are constrained um, by volume related to their uh, nursing faculty. So I would say with UVM, our, our biggest um, partnership project is um, exchanging talent both ways and helping um, the, the faculty have more uh, support from our seasoned nurses on the faculty side, and also that those nursing uh, students have access to clinical experience. So um, I don't have University of Vermont medical, um, University of Vermont numbers in front of me, 
um, but we hire as many new grads as possible. Um, and I know this season overall uh, for RNs, we're, we're tracked to hire at least 120 new grads starting between now and the middle of the summer. Thank you, that's helpful to know. I'll discuss a little bit um, uh, affordability and the affordability criteria relating to uh, the CON process. Um, how do you at UVM measure how expensive your services are on a commercial basis? What what do you look at? Do you want to start, Rick? Yeah, so we're we're close to having access to similar data set that the payers have access to, uh, which is is a, is a um, a vendor that takes all the publicly available trans, price transparency data uh, and and essentially makes it in a much more usable fashion. Uh, we just um, barely um, um, signed a contract. Um, say in the last month or two with them where we'll have a better sense on kind of where we stand from a commercial basis more specifically beyond that what we have today is um, just you know national reports that we have to kind of comb through and and try to uh, get down to a true apples to apples comparison because of the age differences across states and other factors that don't always make those comparisons um, equal but hopefully um, in the not too distant future, we'll have much better data um, to rely on. Who, who's the vendor? I'm just curious if anyone here, if I or anyone's familiar with it. Um, I, if you give me a couple minutes, I'll uh, I'll look it up and I'll send it to you. And then in terms of the national reports, what, what data are you looking at from the national reports? So we're obviously looking at the same reports that the Green Mountain Care Board is um, is using um, as part in their budget deliberation. So we comb through the RAND reports and try to figure out um, exactly what they tell us. Um, again, trying to create a more apples to apples comparison across uh, different parts of the country. I am familiar with the RAND um, data. Um, have you been looking at the RAND 5.0 data and have you made any adjustments to the RAND data to assess the commercial costs at UVM? I have not looked at the, the RAND 5.0 data yet. Um, so the, if my memory is right, I think UVM was in the top decile, most expensive hospital category in the country, uh, according to RAND. I think it was around 420-ish percent of Medicare. I know that you might have manipulations or adjustments you want to make, um, but from that, at least the RAND data as it's published, it appears very, very expensive. And so I was trying to understand, you were talking about how if you go from inpatient to outpatient, it's quite a bit more affordable. And I was trying to understand how that would, um, how we could compare UVM outpatient by some markers that appears quite expensive versus other options that could be available if there are any. Yeah, as, as I said, we haven't reviewed that data yet, but we'll obviously it's something that the Renown Care Board is going to be using. So we'll, we'll dig into it. Um, I think one of the, one of the variables that was highlighted um, last summer in that data that wasn't highlighted by wasn't highlighted by the UVM Health Network. It was highlighted actually by the consultants that um, gave a presentation last summer that a key piece that needs to be factored in is the average age of Vermont commercial commercially insured patients. Um, and I think that that'll uh, that's not really something we'll take a look at with the, the 5.0 data to see if um, that's a key variable that needs to be factored in. 
And in terms of comparison to other outpatient options in Vermont, whether it be Green Mountain Surgery Center, Northwestern, Copley, do you have any sort of sense of how expensive your proposed outpatient surgery center would be? No, we do, we're not able to share that data um, amongst ourselves. Um, again, uh, even when we have access to the to the data, it's going to be very much you know, um, de-identified data to give us a general sense of where we're at. But uh, that's not something that we can uh, that we can do. So one of the things we're really concerned about in the state is the affordability of health care. I'm sure you've all seen the commercial rate increases we've had the last several years. And again, this year, the request is very, very, very significant. Um, and if we were to approve this CON, uh, I'd be curious what strategies you think we could use to make sure that the approval doesn't result in a very high cost place for these surgeries. So I think I can start the, the answer of Chair Foster. So I think one of the things that we've highlighted is um, that the outpatient surgery center is going to shift patients from the inpatient setting to the outpatient setting. So that's one thing that you certainly would be able to, to monitor over time to see how that um, how that transition happens. Um, you'll be able to, to certainly kind of take a look at our commercial rates during the budget uh, review process. We we typically don't get down into the service by service level detail, but um, you'll see our overall budget and be able to be able to to determine whether or not our our rate requests are hopefully be able to determine whether what requests are are good. Thank you. What would you think if the board were to consider benchmarking your prices at the services you're proposing to uh, a lower threshold, basically reference-based pricing the services that you're providing to uh, a more appropriate level if they were deemed high? Would they be for a similar matched population of age, risk-adjusted, same comorbidities? So would the population that we serve match the population you were referencing us against? Well, I'm, I'm trying to come up with ideas with you to see how we could best make sure that the price impact doesn't have a negative impact on, you know, that other side of our job affordability. Um, so, you know, so a colonoscopy cost X at Green Mountain Surgery Center, should it cost the same at UVM or it costs X at Northwestern, should it cost the same at UVM? So the, the <laughs> trick is that the colonoscopy that happens at the Green Mountain Surgery Center is selected differently. So that's a different population of patients that are able to get it there than the ones that we do. We do some like that, but we also do people that are much sicker who can't get it there, who need an expert anesthesiologist, who need a general surgeon, who need sure. other things. So um, it's it, you have to look and make sure the population that you're serving is the same. The Green Mountain Surgery Center serves a very important purpose. And there's many people who can get it there, but they'd be the first to tell you there's people that can't. Also, we provide the ER coverage for them at nighttime. We provide after hour services if they have a complication on one of their patients. The same for a lot of the other sites. If there's a complication at Copley at nighttime, it's very possible that patient will end up at our hospital. So I understand the question and it's a good one, but you have to make sure that um, there's other costs that are built into the care that we're delivering because we're delivering to a different population. So how would we best calculate those additional costs? I, th I think, Chair Foster, I think this is a much more complicated question that we'd love to work with you on, on how to fairly benchmark all the care that we deliver. So again, I, I, don't, I think it's not a fair comparison to look at this in isolation, just like, just like Dr. Leffler just described on the colonoscopy piece or cataract surgery piece. When you cherry pick the patient population and the procedures that you do and don't have to provide emergency coverage evenings and weekends, may even select for non-Medicaid, non-Medicare, non-Medicaid patient populations, which are easier to care for and cost less, and then say, look, we do colonoscopies much less 
expensively than you do. I don't think that's a fair comp comparison. I think what you really, just on a global scale, have to look at all the care that we provide and that we are asked to provide, look at that comparison. We could probably, and this is a, a larger question that, that our federal legislators are also looking at that we're trying to work at, which is if, and this is the broader, broader issue, and you can stop me if I'm going too far on this. So, so in a broader issue, when a private equity based company comes in and finds a market that they want to provide care into, the larger question is, how do we appropriately look at, are they caring for all the patients in that po patient population? What's the cost of providing emergency services? What's the cost of providing weekend services when they can't provide it? It's a question that's being asked right now. And the, way, and the question is really then, how do we tax that for-profit entity that's taking the niche of the market away appropriately to capture those costs? It's a really difficult question to be able to answer, but not impossible. And we could probably work on something to get us there to do that. But but here I think the real question that we've been that we've been challenged with is we know that we have an access issue. You've told us that and you've asked us, how are we going to take on this access issue? And what we've tried to do here is say, look, here, here's here's a first step for us to take on this access issue that we know is real and our patients are feeling and they're telling us about. And we want to provide that service. We have many more of these that we want to take on, and you'll be seeing us bring these forward in a way that I, th I hope is meaningful in the coming coming months to years. I think that's the focus here. The estimates that we've received, the estimates that your consultants have gotten us to, we seem to pretty much agree that we have we have the need. I think um, Tom asked some really good questions about what happens if you know the volume doesn't get there. Yeah, we're worried about that too. We always worry about that. I think that makes sense in the context of what we're doing. I, I had a pretty simple answer. We wouldn't open up the operating rooms that were unopened. We'd be able to not use travelers to a great extent. I think our costs would go down. If that really happened, we would manage to that because that's what we're called to do. I'm much more worried about what Eve said, and I'm much more worried about what features are showing us that if they try to increase the population in Vermont by 100,000 or 150,000 in the next five to 10 years, how are we gonna manage the care? Positive, great workforce coming in. I think that's fantastic. Negative, I'm worried about, are we gonna be able to escalate the ability to care? I, that's a much bigger concern for me because I'm betting on Vermont that it's gonna be, it's gonna grow. People wanna come and live here. I think we're moving in that direction. I, I'm much less worried about how we're going to deal with the, the negative side. But here's the reality today. I want to bring us back. We've got a need for this today. Everything that tells us is that need is going to grow in the next five to 10 years and continue to grow. That's what we're trying to address here. I think we're I think we put forward a really good plan to try to address what our community and our patients need here. And I'd love to focus on that. I'd love to work on those other things. I think they're important because we care about that. We want to drive down healthcare costs overall. We want to be the model for doing that. So I'd love to work on that. But but today, this is this is, this is is what we're here for. Sorry, Steve, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that great comment. And I, I'll just say one last thing, Chair Foster, because I think it's important to keep in context. You can definitely figure out ways to reimburse us less for the care we deliver at the outpatient surgery center, and we will have less or no margin but we're nonprofit. So every dollar we earn at the Green Mountain Surgery or at the Outpatient Surgery Center, I'm sorry, is going to get reinvested into other things that we're losing money on. So if we don't make any money on this project, we'll have less money to invest in dialysis patients, mental health service patients, patients who need pediatric surgery care and other things that we're not making money on. We lose money on many, many things. There's a relatively small number that we actually make a margin on. If this project it's squeezed down to where it's not making a margin. It's still important to do for our patients. We'll have less dollars for other important work that we're trying to do. Thank you. So I, I appreciate that. Um, two, two things. So affordability is very important for Vermont. And so what I'm trying to understand is you've forecasted, I, I might be confidential, so I won't say the number, but 
very, very, very significant profits off of this outpatient surgery center. And most of that profit, I presume, would be coming, not profit in, you know, I understand the nonprofit distinction, but additional revenue above costs. Am I correct that that margin would be, if not entirely, very predominantly coming from our commercial market? Rick, I don't have that in front of me. Do you know where, where the dollars are coming from? It probably is mostly coming from commercial, I would guess, but I, I don't have it in front of me. Um, yeah, I don't have the breakdown either, but we can certainly break that down for you. That it, it it's really coming from all uh, payers. So we're you know we're increasing access and, and capacity across to all the 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 payers, and so the the commercial definitely is a is a large chunk of that, but it's not the only it's not the only piece. But I think does it's Medicare also... provide you? Sorry, does Medicare provide you a margin on these services? Yes, it's pretty close to break even, small, small margin on the Medicare. Okay, so if there's a, a, a operating margin, if you're breaking even on Medicare, pretty close to break even, it's coming from commercial, right? But commercial is also offsetting the loss that we have on Medicaid uh, patients and other, you know, payers. Understood. Okay, and it's not different than our overall margin, right? I mean, that's. Our margin is coming from our commercial payers by and large. I think you're you've hit the nail on the head. Not not on just this three percent that we're talking about of what's coming into the University of Vermont Medical Center, but on everything that we do. Um, we try to make money on everything that we do, so we can whatever whatever Medicare opportunities we, we have to be able to make money on, we will. But you're right, Medicaid we lose money on, and that gets made up with with commercial payers. Is there any information in this submission as to how much money you anticipate losing on Medicaid patients in connection with the OSC services? Go ahead, Eve. Foster, this is Eve. I, I don't have that, but it's, I from a health equity lens, it's kind of not the way we think about approaching it. We think about all of our patients who have needs together and then we think about all of our reimbursement from the various sources that we have. I, mean, I suppose it could be done, but we just that's not the way we approach this at all. Um, I'm trying to understand how much commercial is needed to make up for the loss. Are you suggesting that we should provide care differentially there? Only give only do enough Medicaid patients that the commercial wouldn't have to make up for a big loss. And so we would limit the number of Medicaid patients in this surgery center. Is that I'm not sure if not at all. I'm just trying to okay. understand. My question was, how much of a loss do you have on the Medicaid patients that needs to be made up for in commercial? Hmm. It seems like something we should be able to do and get back to you, but I don't want to. I don't want to promise something that we can't do, um, and I want to make sure that it's relevant for the decision making too. But Rick or Mark is that or Eve is that something we we probably I think we can commit to trying and. Yeah, it's not readily available trying. data. I think the ease point that it's not readily via available data and, you know, we can commit to try. I think the challenge goes back, Chair Foster, in the way that commercial payers contract, that it's not a it's not a straightforward equation because of what we were discussing with Chair, uh, board member Holmes before, because they look at the total cost of what they're gonna put out for the year and they can go up and down in particular areas and they do. Um, and that could be based on a huge variety of variety of things. Um, there could be a national standard to pay X for something, but they know that their overall is gonna be Y and so they're gonna reduce something else or increase something else. It isn't rational or consistent with what you might think would be. Um, we should be paying much more for mental health because of all the time that goes in and substance use disorder, use disorder from commercial payers. 
and that would if they were to do that, they would lower something else typically in order to be able. So it's really hard when you just isolate again. And I think this is a challenge. I know I'm 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 getting out over my skis on this, but um, and Rick and Mark and others can speak more to this. But that's why it's hard to isolate um, when when Mark says we can try, but it's because of that, right? Um, we could say that, for example, Blue Cross could say we're going to pay the same as Medicare rates in the ambulatory surgery center, and we would say, okay, but would you be willing to pay more for cancer care? And they might say yes on that. So their overall cost is going to be whatever they figured it was going to be by the number of patients that they had, but you could artificially lower your outpatient surgery center costs there, and it would look as though it's equilibrating. You know, does that, right? So it's not a, that's why it's hard to do it. Yeah, I, I get that dynamic. Um, so the reason I'm asking these questions is there's a huge amount of margin and, and financial benefit to the network, which is a good thing for the network, but that will be coming out of commercial at a time when our commercial payers are really, really, really struggling with the cost of healthcare and commercial insurance. So part of this decision is whether or not it has an undue increase in the cost of medical care or an impact on affordability. And so these questions are lined to try and understand how much money you actually need to operate this and provide this access. So understanding the loss on Medicaid um, would be helpful to understanding that because essentially the decision we're making, if we approve it at your current rates, is we are going to shift tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars from Vermont commercial payers to UVM Health Network. And I understand the point that Dr. Leffler very eloquently made, which is, hey, we're going to use all that money as a nonprofit to do other good things for the community, right? And that's laudatory, but at the same time, we need to consider that in the context of the affordability crisis we have in Vermont. So that's why I'm trying to probe and understand that so amount of I have a question. So so can I ask a question, Chair Foster? You're assuming that those commercial insured patients don't need the care and that if we don't build this, they won't get it, which I think is untrue. No, I think they might incorrect. go somewhere else. In, in, incorrect. Let me pause you. Incorrect. I'm assuming they don't need to pay that much for this care. So where where would they go to get the care and pay less? And who are the people you're saying the commercial payers would go elsewhere and they'd be able to pay less? That, I'm hoping they could go to you and pay less. But we would have to build something to be able to do Understood. that. Understood. Correct. So, okay. Um, so you're just you're just arguing about the cost of the overall cost here. And I guess the easiest way to keep our cost down would be to prevent the access. That would certainly keep the cost down. But if we're going to provide the access, we're saying that the access is going to be less expensive to do it here than it would be to do it in the existing facilities. I'll use the analogy of the of the Fannie Allen. It's going to cost us, I forget what, don't hold me to the cost of it because I don't remember, but let's say it's $20 million it's going to cost us to purchase it. But it over the long run, it, it saves us money compared to what we expect the rent to be. So yes, it's going to cost us $20 million up front, but we're actually going to make out on that exchange, right? We're going to be able to actually save money by putting out the $20 million. This is a more sophisticated, complicated way of providing the access away from our hospital that at the end of the day allows us to take care of our patients at a lower cost than if we could like somehow, you know, operate 24 hours a day in the operating room at, at, the, at the main campus and do this. Right. And that's the way we're thinking about it. We, we have a clinical need. There's an access issue. We've got to deliver it. And it's a it's the least expensive way that we can think of to do it. Um, and then we at the end of the day have been able to show that at the if our assumptions are accurate and if we get to that, that we can actually make a margin that then we can reinvest to put in towards taking care of the patient population in other areas where we know we're not going to be able because of the vagaries of our payment system that we're able to do that, largely again for Medicaid and Medicare patient pa patients there. I get all that. The decision that okay. is, the, the point I'm making is you could do this at like, let's say a 50th percentile outpatient surgery center. I'm, I'm making up numbers here because we don't have them available. 
you have tens of millions of dollars of excess margin that's coming from commercial with this projection that you have here, right? If you did that at a the 50th percentile rather than the 90th or the 100th percentile, Vermonters would save a lot of money. You could still move it from the hospital to the outpatient surgery center. The difference is you wouldn't have the 40, 100, whatever the number is, millions of dollars that you could reinvest elsewhere. I think that's probably fair to say with the vagaries of our commercial payers of how we would negotiate for that. You're probably There's probably something you could say about that, but that would mean that when we look at trying to hire people to do primary care and mental health, that they just won't be able to move forward, right? Because at the end of the day, we know, as Rick alluded to, we have to make a margin because we have to go back and make sure our elevators are working, the pipes that are bursting are getting taken care of. Like We have to reinvest. It's going to cost us money to do that. And so we've got to make a margin one way or the other. The way that we will get forced to do it is to eliminate services or prevent the act, or not prevent, but in, uh, we'll be unable to get the access that we need to provide the care. So I, I don't, I, I don't, if you have a better solution, we're so transparent about the way that we put the dollars in there um, that we're open to have those conversations totally of how we can better do this. Um, we think that this though answers the question in front of us today, which is we can, we know we have an access issue. We can deliver the access and we're doing it at a place that's going to cost us less and make us more efficient. It's still expensive because medical care is expensive. Um, and you're right, commercial payers pay more than Medicaid and Medicare. And they do in every one, every line of our business. Um, and they'll they'll do that here too. Right. I mean, I mean, what I'm really getting at is that at least according to RAND, and I know you may have some quibbles with the data, but at least according to the RAND data, you're the top decile, most expensive outpatient services in the country, right? Now, that might be different once you age adjust and do the changes, but it's yeah, very, I, very, can very I just expensive. Interrupt, can I interrupt you? Just I just pulled it up just while we were talking. If you look at the total, if you look at inpatient cost across where we are, we're, we're, we're right at national benchmark, right? So I'm just, my point is that you can, and maybe because our outpatient services are offered at, at an inpatient site today, if we're looking at the same thing, um, I have it at 238% versus 240% um, for our inpatient price versus federal benchmark and the state benchmarks at 227%. But so they're very, very close. And, and it's a longer conversation. But so when you pull that out, though, this I mean, it's just a really clear example of, of you have to really know the patient populations that are being used, the communities that are being served, the kind of hospital that you're comparing, that it's it really makes a difference. And we're in a very, very unique situation where we're the only hospital in this region, in the state, um, North Country, that provides the kind of care that we do. We could choose not to do those things and we could deliver care at a lower cost, but that comes at a real cost for our, our communities. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We're always looking, I mean, I'm telling you, we are always looking for how to do this better, more efficiently and continue to attract providers at all levels to be able to do this. If there's a better way to do it, we wanna do it. But I don't think going down this path is gonna get us there. As much as I'd love, I'd love, I'd love to have the conversation. I'd love to take this offline and say, let's look at this and figure out if they're doing it better than we are. How are they doing it? I want to do it that way. Let's do it. I'm not opposed to it at all. And I know Steve isn't either. Um, but I don't know if that's the right conversation to be having today. I'm happy to have it. It's your time. But yeah, I, I'm really just getting at the affordability criteria. So if there's any information you want to share with the board as to um, what the right amount of additional margin on this project should be consistent with our goal of improving affordability for Vermonters, I would appreciate it. And that's making up Medicaid, if that's some reasonable amount of margin, how much additional money, if you're going to use this additional money to care for the patients, um, how are you planning to use it? What is it going to subsidize? Because the argument of we get more money and we're going to use it for all these great things, I appreciate and is fair, but it's uncabined. 
you can always say that there's no limit to it, right? If we're butting up against as a board 20% rate requests every single year these days, we need to be thinking about where that additional money is going and what you're using it for before we can say yes to it. Is that is that fair? So, so Chair Foster, I believe that's what we do in the budget every year. So I feel like it's kind of drifting <laughs> into our budget for 25 now. So I agree with everything that you said. Every year we submit a budget, we work with the Green Mountain Care Board on what the budget will be, what the rates will be for commercial. And then you have very clear information on how we spend literally every single dollar. So I agree in principle with what you're saying. And, and what I would say is for the outpatient surgery center, it's one piece of our overall work that we do to serve Vermonters. I think you heard it's 3% total of our revenue, so a relatively small piece. Um, but you're going to see our budget soon, and you'll be able to regulate you like, like, like you do every single year on how every single dollar of expense that we spend is. Right. So I, you're right. This could be drifting a little bit, but just to focus it on this, if we're approving this, I want to know what the rate are going to be, the costs are going to be, and I want to know why it needs to be that expensive. Okay because I don't at this time want to really increase the cost to commercial. We don't have it, they can't afford it. So our approving it gives UVM more money, which might be used for amazing things, but it's a decision that we need to make. So I just but, want to be but, cognizant of that. But Chair Foster, we're just using the current rates. We're not we're not making them up, right? We're, we're using what the Medicaid, Medicare and commercial rates are for what we're doing. And then we're estimating that they're going to go up by I can't remember now, 455 or 545, whatever it was. There's not, so those are already existing today that that's what we're using. We're not adding anything. We're not, right? We're just using what's out there today. Yeah, I understand. And what I'm getting at is I think that would have a negative impact on affordability using your current rates because they are very high. So I need okay. to understand what the right appropriate level would be given the crisis and affordability we have in the state. Fair. I, I guess I can't answer that today. Um, well, thank you. And I, it was a good discussion, so I appreciate it. Um, I'll go quickly just so we can move on here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, collaborative approach that UVM has taken to sending this potential demand to other providers in Vermont. So, so I'll, let me give you a reference because it may be able to help. So page page 39, it says other network affiliate hospitals cannot be expected to absorb growing demand. And I was curious if there's any steps taken to date to send this demand elsewhere. So I'm going to start at a very high so level, but I'm going to rely on Chris, level, Chris Dillon. Chris. I'm going to rely on Chris Dillon. Dillon to help more. So, um, as you've heard over and over again today, the medical centers ORs are completely full. And so Chris Dillon is our, one of our network um, leaders of the medical group, has worked hard to move cases when there's capacity in other ORs, and it makes sense for the provider and the patients. It's tricky. Finding the right case that can be moved, provider to go with it and patients are able to, is actually really complicated work. Center, this year is moving at least 100 cases at Central Vermont. We've moved, I believe, other cases to, to Porter when it makes sense. I will tell you some patients choose not to do that, but others do. So we have done work internally. A couple key things, Chair Foster. You can't really do it very easily until you have a common medical record. You have to have a record where the provider can sign on from anywhere and access the patient's chart, do orders from anywhere. And it gets really tricky around call where the patient has a complication. As I said, is, is your case an add-on? Um, if it's Dr. Harrington or Dr. Plant, what is their early part of their day? What time are they gonna show up down there? Are they coming back here to do other care? It's really complicated to move surgeons around at different locations. And I would say almost impossible to other sites unless you share a lot of commonality in terms of what's in the operating rooms, what's the equipment they would use, what's the important teams that care for the patients. So you heard Dr. Nichols say that, you know, the ortho team is very important. He has his team, even the team here, that's not the same all the time. He at least has some, understands that group. 
He's an amazing surgeon. It would be hard for him to go to Copley tomorrow and do a total joint with their equipment. I think they have a different robot than we do, et cetera. So Chris, do you want to give some further background and on the important work you've done to move cases throughout the network? Sure. Right, let me, let me interrupt me? because I think, so, sorry. Mr. Dillon, I'm actually going to move on just in the interest of time. I, I think I got that point well enough. I, I apologize for cutting you off, but I just don't want to belabor it too much. Um, I just went off video because I think my internet's breaking up a little bit. Um, this is just my last couple questions about, about Fannie Allen. Um, the services that you propose, I believe, are at page 16 of the submission, your application. And Part of the rationale is that a lot for the new uh, surgery center is that a lot of these services require larger rooms um, for operating purposes. And I was wondering which of these services that you plan on providing require these larger rooms. Well, Patrick, do you, do you want to jump in? Certainly, certainly orthopedics is a big one because of the fluoroscopy machines that are needed during interoperatively, as well as um, uh, Marco, what else, what else needs to be even bigger? I mean, it, it's largely going to be ortho, but it, it, um, yeah, gynecology so the, as well with the, with the, lap, the laparoscopic surgeries that we'll be doing at the, at the right. outpatient surgery center because that requires gas lines and monitors that can't be really mounted in Fanny Allen. Um, so, so go, go please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, you're, you're spot on Patrick. I mean, in essence, what we're talking about outside of orthopedics is when we war work in the words minimally invasive surgery, yeah. then you're bringing on all kinds of equipment, whether it be booms, towers, screens, um, as Patrick alluded to gases, um, you know, a robot, um, and actually robots are used in orthopedics as well, and that, yeah. that requires a larger size room. So, um, and you know, vascular procedures that, again, we say endovascular, that means minimally invasive, they're done through the groin. Um, you know, the, the breadth of what is done medically today um, is not always heralded as it should be. Sadly, it's very expensive, and I'm not here to try and argue that it, it couldn't be cheaper, but it's expensive. And, and you know, I don't need to tell anybody that um, vendors aren't looking to save us money generally. And that's a landscape we have to compete in. And that this is the expectation of our population as well. They don't want their aortic valve replaced through a big bone cutting chest incision anymore. They want it through their groin. And I would want mine that way too. But unfortunately, that requires cost, it requires equipment, and not infrequently a much larger room. So I hope that sort of gives scope without drowning you in detail. And the only other thing I would add is the the anesthesia footprint for all of those bigger cases that can be done at the outpatient, outpatient surgery center is necessary too, because it requires more anesthesia equipment as well. Let the record show that the surgeon forgot about anesthesia. Yeah, again. Sh shocking. Hopefully never in practice, doctor. Never. Um, all right, so uh, I think my last question is, did you consider uh, uh, renovating any of the Fanny rooms to provide the services that do not require these larger spaces and building a smaller outpatient surgery center to save on cost? We did. It's very complicated to run three different OR sites. So then you'd be running the main campus, Fannie Allen campus, and some smaller version of the outpatient surgery center. You'd be running three CSRs, three facilities teams, EVS teams, all those things. Once again, you might have a case for Dr. Harrington where she does the first two cases of the morning at the Fannie because that's the right room, then have to go to the outpatient surgery center in the main campus. It just is extremely complex to try and run three sites um, in, in today's world. And aside probably from surgery, it's uh, the smaller the sites are, the less efficient staffing is, right? We can cover more um, as a bigger group, you know, having larger sites, fewer but larger. Is it, I don't know the answer is at all, but is it, Theoretically possible to add an addition onto the Fanny. 
So I asked Beth that myself, um, that my understanding is that the ORs are so old and actually the building is so old that the equipment that we would need for air turnover for the gases or so on um, makes it nearly impossible to make them modern ORs. I'm speaking for her though. Beth, do you, do you want to add some detail to that? No, I think you I think you nailed it with that. These ORs that are at, at Fannie are over 50 years old. Um, and to to stay up to date with FGI guidelines with air changes in all of the rooms, um, we'd have to substantially upgrade all of the mechanical equipment and infrastructure for those spaces. Yeah, I was getting at sort of just gutting it, gutting it, building bigger rooms if you need more space. Is that more expensive or less expensive? Someone told me more, but I haven't seen the actual <laughs> pro forma. I I can chime in and say that our team, even before we reopened the Fanny, walked through the Fanny. The existing physical footprint of the Fanny would not accept for that. We would have to build additional square footage that I don't you know, again, renovation versus new build is a you know is a rabbit yeah. hole, but unfortunately renovation yeah. is huge cost. Yeah. And in you addition, there would be Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you'd also need a steel stretcher. Uh, the column grid in that building can't accommodate rooms of the size we need the rooms to be without having a column going right through, pick one side of the OR. <clears throat> so in order to, I mean, it's just not physically possible to construct the room size we'd be looking for in a, in a dimension that made sense. Yeah, you'd also have right, to add, I, um, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I have no other questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you all for responding and being here and for your um, submissions and materials. Okay. Um, looks like we're going to be here till after five. I have a hard stop at 530 that I can't go past. So um, I'm going to Go back to Dave Merman uh, for any follow up questions. Uh, plan on a hopefully brief executive session. And then I think what I would like to propose to the interested parties is if you have any comments that you are going to share, if you could put those in writing and submit them by the end of the week. And then it sounds like uh, there need to be some follow up questions. To go to UVMMC, and I would propose that UVMMC could respond to any of the interested party comments when they submit their responses. So, Karen, you can think about that um, while we move through the rest of this. Uh, so, Dr. Merman, do you have any additional questions yeah. you'd like to ask? I just have a few rapid fire questions. Uh, there was a mention, and I think it's somewhere in the narrative, that if the OSC was not open, 4,000 patients per year would not get the care they need by 2030. Is this including with the Fannie closing or staying open? Staying, op staying open. Okay, that's what I th that was my recollection too. Okay, capacity, we talked about 80.1 and 80.9% capacity. And, but the denominator being for a nine and a half hour day, but in the application, it's a 10 hour day. So when you're saying the 80.1, 80.9, is that 250 days at nine and a half hours for all 25 ORs? Or, I can tell you, in fact, it's more, it's to block. Utilization is to block and some block times actually go past five o'clock. Some, there are some rooms that actually intentionally are run later to improve access. So think of it as a th 7.30 start going to either five or seven times all the rooms. Okay, but and but it, it, in the denominator of the calculation, it, it was indicated that it was 7.30 to five. For some block time, it's actually additional. Okay. Could, all the rooms start at 7.30 block. and often we, um, a couple of them are blocked to run later. 
So your denominator is 730 to whatever the block time of each of those rooms. So every day we look at the schedule and see what the block time was for that particular service or surgeon. And that's what goes in the denominator. It can be a little bit different day to day based on if there's two, you know, two surgeons that have till 7 p.m. block time. So it can be a little bit day to day variability, but everything is open until all rooms are blocked, at least until five that started 730. And so a couple of them are blocked to a little bit later. OK. OK, is there a way that in follow up information we could get the the current or most recent separation between UVM and Fannie and the OR utilization rates and what what makes up, uh, makes up the, the denominator? Yes, yes, we can right. provide that in follow up. One other quick question, hopefully a quick question. Um, in the narrative, there was discussion that part of the advantage of the OSC is that you can shift patients to the OSC and thus renovate your inpatient ORs. Um, do you have any expected number of ORs that you intend to renovate and the cost of those renovations? Not yet. I can tell you that we desperately need another CT surgery room and we, on the state of Vermont, needs a second hybrid OR. I'll just say the state of Vermont needs a second hybrid OR. We have the only one right now. It's actually in getting repaired, refurbished right now. So um, once we have the OSC online, and everything is going smooth, then um, we would start that work. But those high uh, acuity areas that we've talked about in the application, CT surgery, neurosurgery, endovascular, um, Vermont needs more capacity in, in all three of those. And that's what we would be able to grow on the main campus. But as Dr. Plant told you, a, a hybrid room actually is two rooms. So yeah. we'd have to make some adjustments to do that because there's so much equipment. And any migration of cases from the main campus or the Van Allen that can go to this Dermopto building? What? Which building? The dermatology ophthalmology building oh. that was approved. There's procedure rooms in there, yes. I believe, right? Yes. So I believe all those procedures that were happening now in the Durham offices, right? Beth, isn't isn't Correct. that true that yes? So it's just moving. Yes. Yes. Clinic and dermatology have procedure rooms within their clinics now, um, and those will be transferred to the 350 Tilly site. And then with wait times, um, do you track reasons for waiting? <laughs> We've gone down that road a little bit. And one of the first things that we did is we actually had um, a narrative of even even more patients in the in the greater than 90 day queue, but it was patient choice that they decided to postpone their surgery until they went to Florida for the winter or whatever or whatever reason. And so we now have a better, more detailed system of that they they have been seen that the patient agrees that they're ready for surgery, that they're medically clear for surgery, and that the case is requested in our depot. So that's been clean. Uh, aside from um aside from patient choice coming out of there that's probably the biggest cleanup that we've that we've done we also track um you know if, if somebody gets sick and the you know day of surgery cancellations and, and things like that but um and then the other the other issue really is prior authorization that we have to go you know a, a step that we have to go through as well when somebody can be um what a surgery is requested, but it still has to go through the prior authorization process. So sometimes that takes time um, and it can be a barrier, but uh, the biggest one that really that really prepared it down was the patient has to agree to be ready for surgery as well. Great. Uh, that's Those are my little hit list of questions. I appreciate you uh, entertaining them. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, Sounds like there were some questions about the confidential materials um, in the application or in the record, excuse me. Uh, and because we hold these hearings as kind of as part of a meeting, um, typically or goes into executive session to ask questions about confidential portions of the record. So uh, let me just pull up the statute. So uh, one VSA section three one three um, a six allows the board to go into executive session to consider records that are exempt from the uh, Public Records Act. 
um, provided that discussion of the exempt record does not itself permit an extension of the executive session to the general subject to which the record pertains. Um, so I think that would be the basis for a motion to go into executive session. Um, and we have another line set up that uh, I think the UVM folks and the healthcare advocate and all the board staff and the court reporter have an invite to. Um, so would any board member like to make that motion? Oh, I see Karen has her hand raised. Yes. I just had a question about <clears throat> what part of the confidential information would be covered, which um, may influence who joins the executive session for the hospital. So the confidential information concerns rates of reimbursement, the reimbursement adjustment that was made for shifted cases to the OSC, um, salary information, traveler rates of payment, and um, the SG2 proprietary model. So uh, start with board member Lunge. Um, so you're the only one I, who I heard who had questions. Oh, I think Mr. Chair Foster had questions too. So uh, Robin, yeah, general not, uh, subject. Sure, the general subject was rates of reimbursement and the reimbursement adjustment. For my and question. Thank you. Owen, did you have questions about the confidential material? Um, I may have some on that topic as well, but that's it. And did anybody else have any questions about other confidential topics? Does that give you what you need, Karen, to figure out who needs to attend? It does. Thank you. And I'm ready to make a motion when you're ready, Mike. I'm ready. OK, I move uh, the board go into executive session to take testimony on documents that have been determined to be confidential under 1 VSA Section 313A6, specifically around rates of reimbursement and reimbursement adjustments in the filing. Any discussion or questions? Sorry, I thought I heard somebody. I seconded. Oh, thank you. I forgot about that. OK, so <clears throat> there needs to be a two thirds vote in favor. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? OK, so uh, in terms of who goes over, like I said, um, board members, board staff, um, healthcare advocate can be there. They have signed a confidentiality agreement. Um, and Karen, do you want to just identify who would be going over from the medical center? I think we'll need um, Dr. Leffler, Dr. Ethan, um, Eve Hoare, Mark Stanislaus, and Rick Vinson, and other folks who are here for the hospital are welcome to join from my point of view, but wouldn't have to. Okay. Um... Then uh, sorry. Um, so why don't we do? Why don't we all switch over um, when we come back out of the executive session into this session? Um, like I said, my plan would be to take public comment and get um, any comments from the interested parties in writing. Um, because of the time. So, and uh, Karen, I see your hand is raised. 
I just have a couple administrative questions. Let me know the right time to cover those. We're almost at our 5.30 adjournment point. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Um, so there have been a few requests for follow-up information after the hearing. And I'm asking, assuming, I guess, that there would be a written um, set of requests for that information from the board. Is that is that what you have in mind as well? I I would, yes, I would prefer to get these questions to you in writing so that yeah. there's no misunderstanding and. Yeah. Yep, yeah, I agree. And the time that we'll need to respond to them will naturally depend on what they are. So we'll have to wait until we see them to um, talk about the timing. The second thing I wanted to cover, you, you'd said earlier that you would ask the interested parties to submit any statements they had planned on making at the hearing and writing, um, which is fine. I, I just wanted to state as we discussed at the pre-hearing conference that the interested parties did have the opportunity to submit written statements on April 25th and none of them elected to do so. So I wouldn't expect to see any new facts, any new sort of evidence in the written statements that the parties would submit after the hearing. I would expect to see just a statement of their opinion of the project with reference to information that is already part of the record. I would agree. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any concerns with that approach? I don't I'm having a hard time seeing if the industry parties are still with us. <laughs> um, any concerns with that from uh, the interested parties submitting? Any comments you have uh, in writing at the end of this week? No problem from us at the healthcare advocate. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Is anyone from Northwestern still on? Is anybody from Copley still on? Okay, I'll follow up. I'll follow up with an email then. Uh, to the parties <clears throat> with that being the plan. Um, and then I think the next thing we need to get to is public comment. There were only three people who uh, put their name down for public comment, and I'm not sure if any of them are still with us after this long day. So let me just see, uh, is Ms. Gutwin here? Um, Miss uh, Elaine Brunette, are you here? Kate Loud, are you here? Sounds like not. Um, and I'm wondering, Kristen, would it be possible to? follow up with these people via email so we could get their comments. Kristen, is that something we can do? Oh, yes, sorry, I can do that. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, and then. Karen, I believe you had said at the pre hearing conference that you have some recorded comments from physicians that you'd like to share. Is it possible to submit those somehow electronically to us? We had actually decided not to, you know, play that recording during the public comment session, so. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, whether we would want to submit it subsequently, I'll, I'll have to talk with folks about that. But if, if we're interested in doing that, we, we certainly could. Okay, well, it's up to you. Just let me know what you decide. Okay. Um, and so with that, if there's no public comment, um, we will, I'll speak with the board. We will get a set of questions out to you um, as soon as we possibly can. Um, and then we can talk about the timing of that response. And I will send an email to the parties uh, regarding the submission of comments by the end of the week. Um, and I think that's all we need to do. Um, but I see your hand is raised, Owen. Um, I had one just clarification question, but is it better to put it? Can we put a question in the written submission as a, or do I have to put it on the record? Um, we can put it in the written questions, but if you want to give uh, folks here a, a heads sure. up to yeah. what, what it is, yeah. Yeah, no, no big deal. Um, it's just uh, exhibit two from the application has a staffing report, two tables on exhibit two, page 14 is one of them, which is without the project. And there's another one with the project. And I was trying to understand the numbers. It has travelers and FTEs. And I was trying to line that up with the staffing expectations that were provided. What I was seeing was the physician FTEs and the traveler FTEs didn't really move with or without the project. And I was trying to understand that. Um, and then the only other part of the question, which we can just put in writing because that'll be simpler, is I wanted to understand how UVM was doing to date on the budgeted uh, staffing numbers. Thank you. Okay, anything uh, we need to take care of before we adjourn? Okay, so Maggie, can we please go off record? And I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Epen. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, really appreciated the conversation, appreciated the the nature of the questions and the conversation. So thank you. I know you. it sounded and felt like you put a lot of time into looking at all of the documentation. And I know that's a lot of work. And uh, so thank you, appreciate it. No, thank you all. Thank you all for spending a very long day here with us. And um, so I'll turn it back to you, uh, Chair Foster, to um, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Um, and I just echo Dr. Eppen the thanks back to you and your team and gratitude for the really strong submission and the work that went into it. It's an incredible volume of work. So we appreciate your collegiality and co cooperation in doing all this as well. Um, any uh, old business or new business for the board? Okay, and I will move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. All right. Everyone have a nice afternoon and enjoy the beautiful.